Welcome to the Homegrown Podcast, a place where we share the truth about food and farming from our kitchen to yours. I'm your host, Liz Hazelmeyer, along with my husband, Joey. Good morning. And together, we hope to educate, inspire, and equip you in your pursuit of true nourishment. Today's recording is very special. It is our first ever real food Mm. journey, episode number one of the series with Sam and Brett. Welcome to the show, friends. Morning. Hey, guys. How are you? We're so excited you guys are here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, glad to be here. As a quick recap, if if you don't know what this is, Mm -hmm. we sent out a survey to all the folks that are in and around the homegrown community, people that are out there just, you know, doing things every day to help themselves live a more nourished life. Mm -hmm. And we said, man, we'd love to bring some of y'all on to share some of your stories and lessons learned. And that's what today is. Mm -hmm. And so Sam and Brett are, we even said it before we hit record, there's a lot of ways that they're ahead of where we are. So I see it as something where I'm going to be able to learn a lot and I'm excited for that. But also I hope that there's, I I hope that there's uh, things that anyone that's listening to this can relate to, Uh right? And, and it's great to hear from experts and we're going to continue to do that. Totally. But also sometimes it's, man, there's things that I'm doing with my life challenges and and it's like, man, so-and-so that has, you know, 50,000 acres or a hundred thousand acres of farmland. I don't relate to that. <laughs> or it's, you know, so-and-so is, you know, has all these degrees and all this, and I don't relate to that and that's okay. And this, that's, 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 uh, that's, that's what we're into. So yeah, want to jump into this. I'll kick us off, off here. Um, so Brett and Sam, super stoked to have you all on. And I wanted to kick it off by getting to know you a little bit where, where it all started. So where you grew up individually. So take turns and who wants to talk first. Um, and then we're going to talk about some of your like early food awareness as you were growing up experiences. Yeah. And then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll converge into when you guys meet, share as much or as little of, of that experience as you'd like. Um, and uh, we'll go from there. You want to go first? Sure. Go. <clears throat> So I grew up in Southern California with my parents. Uh, I grew up on mainly the standard American diet, but I would call it the healthy standard American diet. Um, I feel like our family was unique because my mom made a lot of homemade meals. We never, we were just saying at Thanksgiving dinner last night, we barely ever ate out, but that was mostly from a fiscal standpoint, not necessarily from a health standpoint. Mm. But overall, my mom... Um, made sure that we were around the table every night for dinner, but we definitely followed, um, the recommendations of the day that, you know, everything needs to be low fat. So we had skim milk and margarine and all those delicious (laughs) ingredients in our, in our meals. Um, so I thought that that's what was healthy. You know, Mm -hmm. and I was also always on the thicker side as a kid. Mm -hmm. And so I'd say starting in about middle school, I was just kind of on that roller coaster of dieting, you know, even as starting, you know, from 12 years old. And so, you know, I, you know, whether that was counting calories or it was doing like meal replacement drinks or eating that spongy. Did you ever have that like 90 calorie bread that mm-hmm. literally tastes like a sponge? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I never had this. What is this? Yeah. Cause you're a boy. Okay. Is that why? <laughs> yeah. Well, what was it? It's just really low cal. Like every slice is what? Yeah. 90 it's calories. 90 calories it's, a slice. It's, like, yeah. like a cellophane wrapped yeah, bag of bread, bread that is 90 calories a slice. Okay. Yeah. It looks like your standard loaf of bread, but oh, bread. oh yeah, it just, it tastes terrible. Um, <laughs> You know, and I and I have no like ill will towards my parents because they were doing the best. Mm-hmm. They they were living the healthy diet and nourishing our family by the recommendations at the time. You know, mm-hmm. because this was really before the real food movement became a bit more mainstream. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's how I grew up, and it was hard because I loved to eat, and you know, with all the homemade food that was you know helpful from that standpoint, but with the yeah, with the low fat and with the dieting, it made it really hard, you know, that that fight within myself of, yes. you know, I, I love to eat, but, mm-hmm. you know, I'm always fighting not to eat too much, you know. Uh, I don't know how far I want to go. Uh, go up until we, like, get married. No. Okay. And so I, I guess the first time I really, I was generally a pretty, you know, even though we kind of did the standard American uh, medical system, you know, I was vaccinated all the way through. 
um, standard doctor's visits, just treated everything with whether pharmaceuticals or over the counters. It really wasn't much natural remedies in our household. Uh, so when I hit puberty, started having my cycle, um, I started having very heavy cycles in my teenage years. And so at some point I went to uh, the doctor about that and I got diagnosed with PCOS. Mm -hmm. um, not from, from what I understand now is you need more of a metabolic panel to really truly get diagnosed with PCOS. All they did for me was they did a I mean, they might have done more than this, and I just don't remember. Uh, they did an ultrasound of my ovaries, and I had cysts in my ovaries, and they're like, well, you have PCOS, and so sent me to the gynecologist and said, you need to go on birth control. And I said, well, I'm a bit concerned because someday, what what do I want to do when I want to have kids? And they're like, don't worry about that. That's down the road. We'll deal about with that when the time comes. Uh, and so it's like, oh, okay, I guess this is what we'll do. And so I got on, you know, birth control as what, I was, what, 14. Mm -hmm. um, and even that, you know, even not growing up in like a, quote, crunchy household, like I never loved, you know, being on this conveyor belt. Mm -hmm. And so at a certain point, um, I did pull myself off of that. Um, and just kind of dealt with that until I started having cystic acne. And then in college, I went back into the dermatologist and they said, you need to get on birth control. <laughs> I said, okay, is there anything else I can do? Eh, you need to get on birth control. <laughs> wow. And so, and it was just so frustrating because I, there was a part of me that was like looking for another answer and no one could give me an answer from the medical system. Mm -hmm. And that was frustrating because it's like, it, you guys are the medical professionals. Mm -hmm. You guys are, should be the experts in this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I just wasn't given any... You're like no other options. No other options, yeah. yeah. And so, and, you know, and along the way um, in high school, I started uh, running marathons for a couple of years. And that was great for from the eating side of things because I could eat a bunch and because I needed to nourish myself in order to run, run marathons. And so that was really good for me. Um, yeah, I guess what else happened? Well, I think, well, once we got married, there was a, a bunch of like significant stuff with documentaries and like some other things. Let me, let me jump Yeah, yeah so let me get caught yeah, up. Yeah, had a that. very different background than I did. Well, not super, but. So um, when I was young, I'm, I'm one of three, <clears throat> and uh, I grew up in Colorado. And so when I was young, our diet was super standard, right? So like Kraft mac and cheese in a box, yeah. lots of Jiffy muffins in a box. Um, everything was more or less just what you would go down to the grocery store, buy off the shelves. <clears throat> Excuse me, getting over the flu here. And, uh, and so, and I don't, I don't fault my parents for that at all. I have no ill will whatsoever. No big deal. That's just what people mm -hmm. ate. Totally fine, right? At some point, probably when I was like 10, but I don't remember specifically for whatever reason. I don't remember that either. My mom started eating a lot healthier. Hmm. Um, and I don't know if it's because of the homeschool community that we were a part of, if she was hearing about it from other people, hmm. some, something, obviously some reason why we started eating a lot more naturally at that point. So we started buying raw milk, um, a lot more whole grains, um, a lot more just fruits and veggies, got rid of a lot of the processed stuff. And at some point in that like transition, I would say my mom now is like where we're at, which is very crunchy. So she became crunchy when I was a kid. Um, and as a kid, like you just eat what you're given. I didn't really, to me, it didn't really matter a whole lot. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, except that I didn't care a hoot what I ate when I was a kid. And I remember one time mowing my neighbor's lawn, um, thinking to myself, cause I was drinking a Pepsi out of his fridge. I was like, someday when I'm a grown up, I'm gonna have as much soda in the house as I possibly can because <laughs> My parents didn't have soda and I really like soda at 12 years old. Right. So, um, I didn't obviously didn't care at all. Like kids typically don't, you know what I mean? Um, but now I definitely appreciate where my mom took us on food. I just took, you know, it took like what, 10 or 15 years to like realize that, mm -hmm. which is not uncommon, right. With kids and the way they were parented, you know? So for me, when I went to college, my concern, let's say from like 17 till we got married at 21. So basically when I was in college, my concern was not so much with healthy food, uh, my concern was I was trying to gain weight because I was a scrawny guy. I'm still a scrawny guy. So I was eating more from a how much protein can I take in and how many calories can I take in. I had jobs that were pretty physically demanding. I did some like trail park ranger type stuff. I was on a wildland fire crew. So like I was burning a lot of calories and I was trying to gain weight. So I was eating lots of hard boiled eggs. You should tell them about that summer that you're trying yeah, to gain weight. Lots of tuna, lots of like creatine and all the whey protein powders you could think of, blah, blah, blah. Right. Like one summer I ate. 
I probably ate close to 12 hard boiled eggs a day. Oh my. Uh, oh man. I, 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 to this day, I have a hard time eating hard boiled eggs. Oh. I was taking creatine. I was taking all of the gainers. I was lifting really heavy, like five days a week. And I weighed in at 165. Okay. Mm -hmm. And three months later, I weighed in at 167. Oh, okay. No. And I was taking in something probably like, I mean, we're talking five to seven to 10,000 calories a day. I mean, a lot. Of Did food, you have a tapeworm right? or something? Who knows? I still might. You know what I mean? <laughs> Because I'm down now to 150 then, something, okay? Yeah, he's like 155, yeah. and he's six five. I'm six foot five, okay? So, which I guess we get to that later. But all that to say, my food experience, quote unquote, was I was trying to eat not necessarily healthy. I just wanted calories, and I wanted to put put on muscle, okay? yeah. which mm -hmm. did, did not work for me. Um, backing up a little bit, as far as like medical stuff goes, so I was diagnosed with asthma, which my dad has and my sister has mm -hmm. significantly worse than I do. But I was diagnosed with that around 11 or something. Um, and it was always managed with albuterol, which is fine. I still have some albuterol as needed, you know. Um, but similar to Brett's experience with um, with her ovary stuff, like there really is no other option given to you. If you go to the doctor and they tell you you have asthma, like, well, mm -hmm. here are the medications that you'll be on forever and see you at the pharmacy, right? Like, okay. Well, at 11, like who thinks any different? Well, now, and I would say even before now, like going back probably 10 years, you're thinking like, there's got to be a better way mm -hmm. or something to try at least to not be spending money on these drugs mm -hmm. till I die, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and is there anything else contributing to my asthma other than just you have it, deal with it? You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like mm -hmm. environmental factors, food, mm -hmm. like whatever, you know? So that was part of my journey mm -hmm. as well, which kind of ties us into the point where we got married was like, there surely there has to be some, like we got to think through this a little bit more and figure out if there's any other factors in how we feel other than just, well, it is what it is. And here's some medicine that you got to go spend 200 bucks on every now and then. Like, I just, I, don't, I just didn't like that. You know what I mean? So I guess that pushed me down the road a little bit of trying to figure out like, was there a bigger picture here to this whole feeling good thing? You know what I mean? That's outstanding. So, and let me just recap a little bit here. We just went through quite a bit. The Your whole lives. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so, Sam, I'm hearing from you, you, you were just, just kind of wrapping up that early on, your understanding of food was very much just like something that I eat. It is what it is. And you did at some point, though, learn that you needed to have protein to build muscle, I'm sure. To try and, and build muscle. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. And I've been there 100%. I'll never forget my mom taking me to a nutritionist. I was, I was um, trying to... One, one of my soccer trainers at the time had told me and my parents that it would be really beneficial for the team and for my performance if I could gain some weight. So now as a, as a man, and, and, and we don't, I guess men don't talk about this very much, but there is sometimes like the opposite. Me and Brad are like, cry us a river. I know, I know. Who? But, there, but the, the, so sad. the, 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 no, like <laughs> the feeling that we sometimes get is we look around and like, just like muscle definition and tone and, and strength and, and being like men filling out is like a very, as you're, when you're a boy growing up into a man, yeah. that is something that no, you want to it. have happen. I get it. Oh, yeah. Anyhow, and so when I was told by my soccer trainer that I should to be on par with the other guys on the team, <laughs> it's a very like vulnerable state to be in. Sure. And uh, I'll never forget getting out of the nutritionist and the, and um, he told my mom and me, I needed to be eating. I, and I was not six, five. And still not, let's be clear. Um, I am 5'11", six foot if I'm lucky, or if I, if I thud the number, <laughs> right? Rich. Yeah. And the, the nutritionist told, I, I, I weighed like 140 pounds soaking wet back then. Nutritionist told my mom, I need to be eating at least 6,000 calories a day to be gaining any weight. That's yep. wild. Yeah. So... I don't know if you'd say prescribed, but suggested this weight gainer like shake that I could make. Yeah. And I would mix it in with like milk and heavy cream. Yeah. And it was like, it was like 1400 calories per shake. Oh, yep. And I was doing that. And then like, so if you think about it, I think I did the math and it was like a, a whole Chipotle burrito. It was like 1200 calories yeah. with the tortilla. Uh -huh. And so it was like, I, I did the math. I'm like, geez, mom, like, I have to eat like almost six of those a day. To make this thing work. Meanwhile, me and Brett are eating 90 calorie slices of right. bread. <laughs> Anyhow, um, I relate. <laughs> I totally get it. So I was with Sam in that 100%. I totally resonate. I could not gain an ounce of weight. I just couldn't right. figure it out. It's crazy. Um, it, it just it would not work for me. And yep. uh, it, it is what it is. Now I want it now. So so if one, I want to pause, drop a pin there because this is about you, not me. Is there any other un, like? Is that the extent of what you would say early on your understanding of food looked like? 
Well, so speaking for myself, I would say, I mean, as I grew older, like I, there was an awareness that like my mom was making these food decisions for a reason. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so like I began to realize like, yeah, there are categories of food. Like there's clearly junk food. Mm -hmm. There's like regular food. That's probably not a big deal. And then there's like super healthy food that doesn't taste very good <laughs> in my mind at the time. Right. Like lentils and brown rice. Yeah. Um, but most of the food I would say fell into that middle category for me, which is like, it's fine. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Um, and my mom was a good cook. Let me establish that as well. So I'm not saying my mom didn't cook good food, like tasting food, right? Um, so it wasn't like my mom ate healthy food that didn't taste good. I don't want to draw that as a one-to-one -one because that is a common misconception, right? We should get into that at some point. Mm -hmm. But um, for me, I think I just saw most food as like, it's not as big of a deal as we probably think it is. It's not McDonald's, but it's not like, you know, raw kale and everything in between is fine, right? Mm -hmm. For the most part. Totally. And Brad, is the same. So for you, I don't think we, we got there as much as, as we did with Sam. And so what would, what did you, what would early on your understanding of food, how, how would you define that? Definitely more from the calorie standpoint, mm. you know, that, you know, more so than, you know, I guess that's even more broken down, you know, fat carbs and protein. I'm not even sure. I thought you were just looking at really calories. Sensibly. You were looking at like, is it processed? Is it whole? Is it organic? Is it not? You were just thinking calories. Yeah, right? for the most yeah. part, and yeah. and and like Sam, that you know, fast food is less good for you, and you know, vegetables are good for you. I also I need to mention, like, I hated vegetables growing up. Like, mm. I didn't, I never ate vegetables growing up. I started eating a little bit of spinach when I was in high school, and that was that was it. It was bad. Um, my mom always joked that she could feed me anything until I was 18 months old and I started spitting it out and then I basically never ate a vegetable again. Oh, wow. <laughs> Unless she forced it down. Yeah. Mm. So that, that's yeah, pretty basic. Yeah. Because I would say I had the same thing. Like I was locked into calories for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. Well, that's that what both... <laughs> yeah. It must be the messaging because both men in the room mm -hmm. are focused on protein and muscle growth and weight gain and both women. In the 90s era, right? Mm -hmm. We're like, yep. cut calories, get as thin as possible, uh, battle your biology. I mean, I guess all four of us felt that to some degree. Mm -hmm. but that's, I don't that's think really that's necessarily taught by our parents, but yeah. you, it just, it comes in from the culture. <laughs> yes, I totally agree. That's, yeah, that's, that's so true. Um, what did, what did family dinners look like? We had a very solid family dinner. That was one thing that I think our family did really well. Mm -hmm. We had a dinner around the table almost every single night of the week. And cool. we, you know, had like set nights of the week that we had certain meals, like we had fish every Monday mm. and then like burgers every Tuesday and the steak on Saturday and curry on Sunday. So that's fine. I feel like yeah, your mom is a good cook. Oh yeah. My mom is yeah. an excellent cook. Yeah. And Especially we... now that she uses more real food. She is an even better, good even cook. more excellent cook. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we yeah we're the same way. We we always had family dinners. My parents made that a priority, which is awesome. And yeah, no complaints at all there. You guys have kids today? Yeah, we do. We have three now. Yeah. What does family dinners look like? Jumping ahead a little bit here, just because I think like yeah. we're on the topic. What do you what what after having that experience yourself? And it's it's the the odd bird out in this room currently would be Elizabeth because I don't think your family dinners looked quite like that. At least mm -hmm. certainly not like my mom didn't rats for us. This yeah. has she described it, um, but mine I did. We had very, very consistent family dinners around the table, just, you know, airing grievances and jokes Fighting. and the whole thing, right? It was awesome. Um, but so you have kids today. And so what, is, what do family dinners look like to you today? And, and, and what do they mean to you? Mm, right. Yeah. I mean, I definitely prioritize dinner time is where I get a fresh meal on, mm. you know. So breakfast, you know, Sam usually makes breakfast for you know, the kids every morning, which is usually, you know, just something basic in the morning. And then we do some sort of leftovers for lunch. And then at dinner time is when, you know, I'm planning that out. I'm making sure that I'm sourcing our, you know, seasonal ingredients. And I prioritize rotating new things, not new things, but, you know, working in, you know, my rotation of what, maybe a month's worth of meals. Mm hmm you know, thinking through having that, you know, something different every night, you know, which, but, so our kids are, you know, we have a fresh six and almost four and a one-year-old. Mm -hmm. And so they don't necessarily value those things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hopefully someday they will. Uh, I believe they But know. we, it is the one, you know, they know there's the expectation that, you know, mom makes dinner and then we sit down as a family and we eat dinner and, 
you know, we've been trying to incorporate a bit more of, hey, let's talk about our day. What is something that you were really thankful for today? Mm-hmm. What was something that was disappointing to you today? Like, what was your favorite thing? What was not your favorite thing? I mean, we still have little kids. A, so a family connection about. time, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Which is kind of what you're talking about too, Joey. So yeah, I w- yes, I would agree with that. And it, it is one of those like points in the day where depending on how busy the day has been before that or afterwards, maybe we have like small group afterwards or I have a meeting at church or something or whatever the case is, like you've still got that very predictable, very consistent time as a whole family at the dinner table. So it's about the food in some senses, but also it's about the touch point for the family to have that on a very predictable, reliable basis. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? And yeah. we'll probably get to it more later, but you know, with having a small farm, you know, in the summertime, sometimes we're not eating dinner until eight o'clock at night. Mm-hmm. And then this time of year, you know, we might be eating dinner closer to five mm-hmm. <laughs> just because, yeah. you know, there's a lot to do around here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I was talking to a friend much wiser than me. We were on a trip together and he was talking about how he raises his family. It inspired me a lot. And we, we've we been, impl- we're a big fan of the family meeting around here. So mm-hmm. we've got a 12 year old, a seven year old and a three year old. And so we have like one and a half participants in that, in that family meeting. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, and the three year old's just like, woohoo, right? Running around. But um, my friend, my buddy told me he was parenting his kids and he said, you don't want to be the super strict parent, but you don't want to be the laissez-faire parent. There's there's a there's a balance of having things in place that take away the chaos from your kids. Because mm-hmm. if you if you let them just reside in chaos, while while them having autonomy and freedom can be fun for them, mm-hmm. it's putting them in a place of chaos, and that that actually is is harder for them and harder on them. Yep, and okay. so this mm-hmm. idea of having consistent bedtimes and consistent meals around the table can actually be more than just the family memories that you'll have, you know, in the future when mm-hmm. you get older. Although I think that is also awesome and a big deal. But um, anyhow, I think having the the systems in place to eliminate some of that chaos can be can be a big deal. So yep. um, I love that. So let's let's talk about how you guys met. How'd you guys get together? The uh, you know, and where'd y'all meet? So we met in college. Uh, we she looked at me like that because there's a story here. Okay. <laughs> there was the a story. brief pause. Yeah. yeah. So you can tell it because it was your fault. Fault. Go ahead. Blame. It worked out well. It worked out. No, yes, we met did. in, we yeah, we met our freshman year of college. We were both, I was a uh, pre-physical therapy kines major and Sam was a bio major at the time. And so we met in chemistry class. Mm. <laughs> All the jokes. Oh, Do the jokes, everybody. <laughs> there was chemistry. This, this is, for the record, at a small Christian school in Southern California. Okay. okay. So. Yeah. Let's see. So we met in chemistry class. I can My brain is... Well, okay. So here's what happened. So, <laughs> we, so we both had the flu this last week, and so I'm not firing on all cylinders today. <laughs> I'm used to running on no sleep, so it's fine. So we I'm met... We met Oh, okay. Oh no, that's not true. We didn't meet in no, we chemistry class. No, we met in the class. dorm room. You're right. Yes. Yes. My my bad. That's right. Do you want me to tell this? I'll tell this. Okay. So I'm playing ping pong <laughs> in the dorm. Okay. Her friend, who's a mutual friend of mine, I just met this other person, Lexi, comes over to the dorm, brings Brett. I meet Brett in the dorm room, or in the dorm playing ping pong in my dorm. Okay. This is like a month or two into freshman year. Girls were allowed in the boys' dorms. Just dorm in the common room. Oh, sorry, area. Sorry. Oh, sorry. 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 Let me clarify. Okay, Not dorm so room. Funny. There's a shared space between okay. the wings. But okay. this was a night. So yes, this is otherwise this is a Christian school. It's called Open Dorms Night. And so yes. they have like, what do you know what I'm talking about? Like oh, yeah. one night yep. in yep. the fall semester and in the spring semester where you can go into the boys and girls dorms. The only oh, yeah. night the boys clean their rooms. They should have more of them <laughs> for that reason. And it's like a two to three hour period. That's the only time you can go in their rooms. The and doors then, are open. And the doors and the doors stay open. Yeah. You know about Why do you stuff. think I asked? My brother went to a small Christian school and it was like, you may not enter if you were of right. the opposite sex. But then they That's had right. these open dorm nights. I there know. I That's know. Good. Okay. So continue. All right. So, so it's open dorms. However, I'm not in my dorm room. Right. I'm in the lounge. I'm in the lounge. <laughs> it's a in the lounge. I'm playing ping pong. Okay. Brett comes over with another friend. I meet Brett. And I, in my 18-year-old self, was a very prideful person. I was on a very high horse, okay? I was from Colorado. I thought that was a really big deal for whatever reason. And I said something about, like, Colorado was the best or whatever. And she said, oh, well, I'm from Colorado too. And I was like, no way. So then she's like, yeah. And I'm like, well, what part? And she told me she's from Avon, right? Well, Avon is a very small town, like two hours from where I grew up. And I was like, oh, well, 
probably is. Like, where else would you know Avon from? You know what I mean? So then we started talking about Avon, okay? And I come to find out she's homeschooled and all this other stuff, okay? I'm like, wow, this is really great. So not only is she attractive, but she's also from Colorado. It's like, this is, you know what I mean? This is really cool. So- I think now, I, I said I was in a snow skiing. Yeah, it's all this <laughs> junk about being in skiing and all this. I mean, if I said I like something, she's like, I like it too, you know? So- and I think, you know, Sam just doesn't pick up on cues very well because my friend are just true. we're laughing and we clearly, you know. clearly I was like missing that there's maybe something more here. Okay. That so, we're being very sarcastic. So we go to chemistry class. This is where chemistry class comes in. Every day we're in chemistry or three times a week we're in chemistry class together. And so for the next several months, I see her on the way to and from chemistry class after chapel or in chemistry class. And like I keep talking about Colorado and she keeps making stuff up about Colorado. And this goes on for like three months, okay? And now I have developed a legitimate crush, if you want to call it that, on this person who's homeschooled from Colorado that likes all the same things I like, okay? And then she pulls me aside in the in the cafeteria one day. By I, the, so, I start feeling very guilty about that. As yeah. she should, right? <laughs> yeah. As she should. So she pulls me aside in the cafeteria <clears throat> by the cereal and the milk, okay? <laughs> yes. Next to the dish room, as if I remember any of the details. <laughs> and she says, I need to tell you something. Like, dun, okay, dun, what do you dun. want to tell me? You know? She's like, well... I'm not from Colorado. I was like, what? You know? She's like, yeah, it's been a big joke. We thought we'd maybe keep it going the end of the semester, but all year, but I felt bad. I need to tell you. Yeah, we started developing a friendship and And it was built around this fake thing, right? <laughs> so then at that point, I was I mean, I was like at the time I was like really embarrassed, you know what I mean? But like, you know, what are you gonna say, you know? So then I had to sort of decide in that moment, like, well, I don't know anything about her really that's like totally real. So I come to find out she's from California, which is the worst, you know what I mean? <laughs> And so I'm like, I like someone from California, from Southern California, you know, how terrible is that? And she wasn't homeschooled. She went to public school, you know? So for me, it was just like <laughs> this whole idea of who she was just blew up in my mind, you know? But fortunately we had developed enough of a friendship around common interest at school at that point that like, mm. I was like, well, you know, the damage had been done. So going forward, I mean, here we are married after 10 years, right? Clearly it worked out, but yeah. there was definitely a period of time there where I was just like, what in the world, you know? So that's how we met, right? We met, she lied to me, drug it on for a while. <laughs> then she told me the truth, happily ever after, you know what I mean? But that was in college, right? That That's to nutshell the answer. We met in college, we dated for a year and a half, got engaged yep. and got married six months after that. So we were basically together for two years, got married what, what would have been our last semester of our senior year, mm -hmm. which we graduated early. So we got married in August, graduated in December, right? So we got married in college. So what would have been a traditional, we got married between our junior and senior year, but we... Yeah, but it was really basically right. Yeah, we, we consolidated were... our credits down and we graduated semester early. So we only had one semester in college together before, um, after we were married, before we graduated. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So we got, yeah, yeah. So we got married, graduated about four months later, then just real quick, like overview, we moved to Wisconsin in January of well, 14. Well, what happened, so I was a pre-physical therapy major <laughs> in college and so then... While we were planning to get, while we were planning our wedding, I was applying to graduate schools around the mm -hmm. country, and uh, I have my mom's side of the family is all from Wisconsin, and so uh, UW Madison was one of the schools where I where I applied to, um, and was one of the first schools that I got into, and so we ended up accepting there. So as soon as we graduated, uh, we moved back to Colorado for about a month, and then we moved to Wisconsin. Uh, shortly after that in January of 2014. That's right. Yeah. And then yep. we lived there up until two years ago, um, almost exactly to the day, actually today. We moved two years ago okay. today no way. to Tennessee. Mm -hmm. So we've been in Tennessee for two years to the day. Wow. Yeah. So we can Congrats. talk about the stuff that happened during that time, but that's kind of how we got to where we are now is married in college, moved to Wisconsin for grad school and stayed and then moved to Tennessee in 2021. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Sam, were you homeschooled? I was actually homeschooled. Yeah. I was okay. homeschooled 12 years, like all the way through. And Brad okay. was actually public schooled all the way through, basically. So we yeah. have two di very different educational backgrounds, Same. right? Same. Same and here. Which one of you was the, well, see, it's homeschooled. He was homeschooled. Ah, I, I was went homeschooled. to public. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, my parents cared about my education. Just... Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's crazy how that works, right? One homeschooled, one public school. And yet here we both sit today. I say all the time, <laughs> Joey is the more well rounded human being. It's not true. And it is true, okay? And Everyone it's the agrees. the school moms that are homeschooling our children. <laughs> yeah. We're like, sit down. 
That's so funny. Raise your hand if you have to go to the bathroom. No, I'm just kidding. I don't do that. Um, okay, so you guys met. You Obviously, you bring in all kinds of baggage when you get married. Everyone does. But you, I want to focus on this food space. At what mm, point right. in your conversations led you to buying a farm in Tennessee? Like, oh, yeah. Walk us through how that even happened and how your food journey, I assume you were scrapping it when you're first married as yes, we all are correct. you know yes. you're like yes. let's oh, get yes. the cheapest rice packets at the yes. store yeah why do you that our first apartment um you could actually see like <laughs> in our bedroom you could see light in the corner the walls <laughs> oh, were gosh. like properly made it was oh, a very gosh. it was very basic yeah. shall we say mm-hmm. yeah and we were on a shoe string budget so we were eating like a lot of like 99 cent a pound two dollar pound chicken and beef and like yeah. noodles you know what i mean which mm-hmm. is perfectly fine yep. you know and but, I wouldn't think that we needed to buy anything higher quality. You know, I thought right. it was perfectly sufficient. We were, so obviously we weren't we thinking were, about like quality of food dude, at that point. We were mm-hmm. trying to like not go broke. Right. So. Right. Yeah. Um, so while I was in grad school, um, we got Netflix at some point. <laughs> and so when I was, you know, had time off from school when I was not studying, I started perusing Netflix documentaries and mm-hmm. While doing that, I came across documentaries. I think the first one was Food Inc., um, which yeah. is kind of, I feel like, one of the OGs of yeah. you know the food documentary mm-hmm. world. And that was like eye-opening for me. That was the first time I saw Joel Salatin. Um, that's the first time that I really heard. Outside of like PETA, you know, I would really hadn't heard anything um, as far as as this whole, you know, alternative food space. Mm-hmm. And so that was really eye opening for me. And so I was like, oh, that was cool. And so, you know, I started perusing more. And, and then I came across Forks Over Knives. Have you heard of that one? Mm-hmm. And so, and that obviously is very different than Food Inc. And so I was like, okay, Sam, we got to go vegan now. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and, you know, so we watched that. And then, you know, I, at the same time, I saw, what was it? The Human Experiment, I think mm-hmm. it was called. It's, that's more, um, talking about like chemicals in the home and everything. And business and of being born. Business of being born. Ooh. Yeah, that was fun for Sam. <laughs> did you watch that, Sam? Because I tried to get Joey to watch that and he, he I turned think it I off. Did. I did watch that one. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Wow, yeah. I'm impressed. It's like done in like the 80s. Kids, right? so. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. it's a hard one to watch just because it's, it's kind of old, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, at the time, it didn't feel that old. I mean, now it probably feels. Yeah, and you were soaking up all that stuff. Yeah, because this was back around close to 20... 16, 15, no, 15. Yeah, probably 2015. Yeah. I mean, was it old? I don't, I guess I don't remember it feeling like that old of documentary. I don't know. <laughs> it felt kind of 80s vibes for us, but yeah. whatever. Anyways, okay, so you're watching Food yeah, Inc., so which I'm is watching... like very much like industrialization You'll hear that one a lot of, from a lot of people. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so so I'm, I'm, I'm watching these documentaries. Uh, and then, so we moved to Madison, Wisconsin. So if anyone's familiar with Madison, it's a very green city. So you have like a lot of like hippies from the seventies that are now, you know, uh, that's where they live. Yeah. And that are now, you know, boomer age and they're living a very kind of, kind of crunchy lifestyle. Um, but it's kind of like the liberal crunchy is what, how Madison is. Um, you know, some people bike everywhere, lots of green space, lots Mm -hmm. of co-ops. We have the largest farmer's market in the entire country. Like it's awesome. Like Mm -hmm. you have the Capitol square and there are booths lining the entire Capitol building. There's probably, I don't know, well over a hundred booths. It's amazing. Every Saturday morning, if you ever have, I know you guys are in Ohio, if you're ever close enough to go visit that, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, and so we're just kind of in this culture that prioritizes kind of more, real food, organic food, local. environmentalism, mm-hmm. yeah, local. Um, and so we're just kind of, you know, drip by drip, getting a bit more educated on what, you know, what true nourishment looks like. Uh, so we got a membership at the local co-op and I start buying a bit more of our food from there. And some of that was just con- convenience because I was going to, when we first got married, we were on a shoestring budget. And so I was going to as many grocery stores as possible just to get the cheapest Mm -hmm. options for everything. Mm -hmm. And then as we had a bit more flexibility in our budget, I could prioritize on where it was 
I guess, a bit more pleasant to shop and just had, it would, you know, like at our local co-op, you know, you don't have 10 options for everything, but you might have like two organic options and maybe a conventional option. And it might not be the lowest price, but it's not horrible. Uh, so I start shopping at that co-op more, so, or, you know, because it's in Mad in a, a city like Madison, even like our local our Costco has more organic options than say our Costco did when I lived in Southern California. You know, I'd go home and visit my parents and the same stuff that I would buy at our Costco in Wisconsin, they just wouldn't have the same equivalent. You know, they'd have a conventional equivalent in California. Different market, right? Different market. Right. And so we were just living in an area where the market prioritizes those those things right. more. Now, at this point, I would say too, though, like we're, as far as the journey goes, okay? okay. Mm -hmm. So like now we're talking about eating more organic stuff, eating more local stuff, I would say some more fresh stuff, right? But we're still talking about not necessarily a like really whole, real food type diet. We're talking about just more stuff is organic and it's not as bad, but like we're still yeah. transitioning from like normal, regular boxed food to like what we eat right now, which we can get to that point. But, you know, we might still be eating a box of mac and cheese, but it's Annie's mac and cheese, yes. right? Which is better, let's be mm -hmm. honest. But we're still talking about mostly things that have organic labels on them. Uh, would you say at this point for the most part? Yes, right? I would say for a long time, that was a journey for me, realizing that organic is not superior to local. Mm. And that was probably only in the last mm. five years where I've, you know, kind of realized all the baggage behind the <laughs> organic label. And just, right. just because something isn't labeled organic, but is local, it doesn't, you know, that the nutrient density of that food can be greater than an organic food or definitely an organic box food, you know, that originates from, you know, the depleted soils of California. Right. Uh, I think one of the, the books that I read that really started to pull things together for me was uh, In Defense of Food. Mm -hmm. it was Michael, Michael Pollan. Pollan. Yeah. He really, he talked about how you have, all these different cultures around the world that eat very different diets, but they all are very healthy. And he talked about how, you know, in the, in our Western culture, we break down food into its core nutrients. Mm -hmm. And we think about food, you know, kind of how I grew up, you know, we're thinking about calories. We're thinking about protein. We're thinking about fat. We're thinking about vitamins and minerals, but do we really understand that, you know, in some of these traditional dishes, like when they mix certain um, ingredients together, like, yes, you can break down like the chemical composition in a certain way and make certain conclusions about that and how it affects your body. But there's ways that like ingredients, whole foods work together in dishes and within our bodies that we don't even understand that we mm -hmm. are just being very full of ourselves to believe that we understand the fullness of how food foods interact with each other and interacts with our bodies. You know what I mean? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So that, that was like a big thing for us, like she said, probably five, six years ago was, and that's where we're at right now, as far as the way we look at food is, you know, whole food, real food is what we talk about as being like the most nourishing thing, right? Because even if you take a healthy food that's organic, when you process it, you break it down into all its constituent ingredients and you store it or you chemically alter it or whatever, and then you reconstitute it, that is categorically something different, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Than actually just eating it in its original form, right? Mm -hmm. So we have become now much more what we would call not necessarily healthy food because that label is a meaningless label anymore, but a whole food or a real food um, family where like we eat things that are basically unadulterated as much as possible, right? Mm -hmm. And for us, because of the farm we have, which, you know, we have a farm now partly because I grew up on a small farm. So, you know, Brett was encountering Joel Salatin and stuff in those first documentaries. You know, I had been out of that for 10 years at that point, but, you know, I grew up, with you know some of our own like we had our own beef we had our own garden we were part of a csa type share place so i was familiar with all that it was just sort of a, for me it was just not from my mind anymore at that point until we started getting back into this but for us now like you know we try to eat as much food that is basically was fresh and then we either you know we, we canned it ourselves or we cooked it ourselves or something but we didn't we try not to get it somewhere between fresh and then where it's shelf stable because that's where unless we're talking about like a grain or something because that's where a lot of your nutrient stuff is lost mm -hmm. and it becomes something entirely different right mm -hmm. so and what i've learned along the way 
and then sorry, I know I cut you off. But what I learned along the way, and this has been the, one of the biggest things for me in terms of getting on board with all of this, because I would, Brett was the spearhead of this, okay? Um, I came along for the ride for a lot of this. I would say now we're at the same place, but um, I came along for a lot of, for, for the ride. But one thing that was big for me was realizing like, when you start eating food like that, like actual whole food that's been cooked, put together and made into a meal, it tastes so much better, okay? Like off the charts better. And I finally started realizing like, this is just better food. Like it tastes better. It's more filling. It's just all around better. I feel better when I eat it, right? Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't make my asthma get funky. I don't feel bad. Like my acne would get bad if I would eat certain stuff. Mm -hmm. Like when you eat really good food, it tastes better. It's like just a much nicer meal experience, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, realizing that I got on board with it too, just from a like, this is just, if we're going to eat seven, you know, days a week, three times a day, we might as well eat something that tastes good, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and I was sold on that. Um, and also from a financial perspective, you know, we were spending more money on food at that point, right? And we were fortunate because mm -hmm. of my job that we were able to, you don't always have to spend more to eat better, okay? But at least for us at that time, it was costing us more. And so because we were getting a better eating experience out of it, that helped me get on board with it as well, because, you know, our food budget went up, like, let's be honest, it, you know, it definitely didn't cost as much as buying the cheapest stuff we could get it at Kroger, right? So, but our medical budget is aside from insurance premiums or healthcare premiums, we don't have much of a medical budget. Yeah. At all. Right. That was something else too, that we learned along the way was, you know, and, and this is just from looking around and realizing, especially as, you know, we've just kind of I don't know, gotten more wise in life. Like people are just around us are just chronically unhealthy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like we live in a unbelievably unhealthy society, like yes. unbelievably unhealthy. And you start looking at, you know, okay, what do we spend on healthcare as a society? Our food is cheap. Like Americans eat cheap as a percentage of our income. Yes. It's very low devoted to food, right? Relatively speaking. Um, but overall, our, our, our health insurance costs or health care costs, I should say, are like catastrophic. There's got to be something there because if you look back in time, those, those lines cross the other direction. Mm -hmm. We spend a lot more money on food and a lot less on health care. But now we eat as a society, we eat absolutely horribly and no one would deny that as a whole, right? And then we spend a ton of money trying to deal with chronic illnesses, yeah. which to me at some point it just like made no, like, that just does not make sense, you know? Yeah. And some of the food decisions that, and cause I mean, I'm not perfect either. Don't get me wrong. Like I like my sugar-free rock stars every now and then, right? Or like <laughs> some sort of junk food, you know? But I think to myself, like when I'm 70 years old and I have cancer because of this, or I'm 50 and I have cancer because of this, like, was it really worth it, you know? Mm -hmm. And if you look around at all the people right now who are 50, 60, 70 and do have cancer and diabetes and heart problems, and they have this and that and that, it's like, that's not really what I want for myself in 20 years, to be honest no. with you. Like, yeah. I just really don't, you know? But that's where I'm headed if I if I live like that and eat like that. So I'm just trying to avoid that, to be honest with you. I think, yeah, nutrition and physical activity are things that, or fitness are things that, man, like, I, I love the example you used of like the lines, they, they, they pass it at some point. It, we started spending more money at some point. They, like they crossed over, right? At one point, probably equal, right? And now it's right. the, the lines kept going in different directions. Right. Now we're spending more money on healthcare and less money on, uh, I'm going to call it just like self-care maybe, where, where we're, you know, whether it's nutrition, fitness, I mean, like whatever you want to call it. Um, but like all of that stuff wrapped up together can benefit you so much. And I, and I, mm -hmm. and I totally agree. I want to back up a little bit. And so um, love everything you're sharing. And, and, and I, I want to hear um, like, what, was there a moment? So, so we saw the documentaries, but was there a moment? And I think Brett sounds like from what Sam was saying of like along for the ride initially, and I want to get to that. So don't lose that. But was there a moment, Brett, where you're like, man, I, I just started, I started seeing food through a different lens. And, and you talked about doing different diets. Take me back to the first um, like I, I need to, I need to make a change for our family or for me and Sam. Uh, was there a moment there of a specific, um, light bulb? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I'm not sure if there was a, sp if it was definitely during one of the, I, I couldn't pinpoint, was it during food ink? Was it during, you mm -hmm. know, folks overnight? Was it during one of the millions of, you know, health and wellness books that I read over that period. Um, because definitely, you know, those, it, those different resources were, were kind of directing me in different mm. directions. Yeah. They're not yeah, all but, saying the exact same thing, right? No, so, but, yeah. all, hard. but, all, yes. but they were all had the same goal in mind of trying to steer you away from chronic illness mm -hmm. and to steer you towards 
health and longevity. Mm. Uh, and I definitely, yes, realized while pouring over those resources that our family's lifespan and health span may weigh heavily, you know, mm. on our decisions on what we are feeding our family, mm -hmm. that, that what the foods that we are eating matter and that food is medicine in that way. Yeah. Wow. Um, you know, and over time moving away from, you know, okay, we're eating food and like lay on the supplement, you know, lay on the supplements heavy in order to get your nutrition to let, let food supply the majority of that supplementation. Yeah. And so, and then only have to add in as little as possible on top of that, if that yeah. makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I feel like very early, you know, even with that first documentary, like that, you know, Food Inc. kind of made the, you know, really kind of set that ball rolling. That, and, so and how, I just wanted more. I just craved more and wanted so, to learn more. So you you had these convictions all of a sudden yeah. of like, man, I I can make decisions that impact me, myself. And this my, is before you guys had kids, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Quite a my bit. My spouse, my future kids. My, That's cool. These are these are big these are big decisions. And at some point you showed, you decided that was was going vegan the first kind of diet choice you made? Yes. Yeah. I believe. Which yeah. which you we've know, talked about <laughs> can be a good good we place to start. Too. So we yeah, we, we, we no no shame at all. I think yeah. I think there's a lot of things gosh, we've talked about like this idea of the vegan mindset. There's so many things that can be right. Well, back to what Sam said, it's confusing because you hear all of these documentaries, books, whatever, mm -hmm. and they're all saying something different. But I will tell you the vegan community, one thing they have got, even though it's sometimes cultish, is that a lot of them are saying the exact same thing. Right. So they right. have some consistency. symmetry and consistency. This is true. Whereas folks in the real food space, it's a little more nuanced. It's a little mm -hmm. hairier. Great. Some of us eat grains. Some of us don't. Yep. Some of us drink raw dairy. Some of mm -hmm. us don't. And it right. makes it Some hard. of us are all oat milk all, and all organic. And it's just, it's yeah. all over the place. Right. So, but, so talk to me about, talk to me about this vegan diet. I want to hear both of your opinions. <laughs> uh, I want to hear what it's like to be growing up homeschooled on small farm, uh, marrying some, you know, a city, right. city, you know, like to right. going vegan. I'm just curious about how that how that played out. What kind of results you saw, um, and and what that was like for you guys. I just want to say two things. Okay. <laughs> One, um, when you're starting to eat organic, veganism is much cheaper. When you're not buying mm -hmm. your meat in bulk, sure. and you're just buying like cuts of meat at the butcher, it was way cheaper to try to cut meat and dairy out. Totally, because they're just they're more expensive things to buy. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was also, in, mm -hmm. you know, a uh, there was a financial motivated. side to that. We knew we could eat healthy, eating mostly vegetables. Oh, uh, wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, because if we wanted to eat meat and dairy, like Beans are cheap, thing, it was going to be expensive, right? Mm -hmm. And so part of the decision to eat vegan was financial. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. Yep. And then I, I, so I have a specific memory of making this one meal and there was avocado over the top of it because the forks over knives method, they also don't do any oils as well. So it is really void of fat completely. Wow. And so they had like half an avocado over the top of this meal. And I just remember like, I just wanted, like I ate up that avocado and I had like the rest of the meal there and I just wanted more avocado. I just <laughs> craved that fat. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> it's just like, okay, is there something, are, are we that... missing something here? Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was along for the ride, right? Like, I mean, it was good tasting food and I felt mm -hmm. good eating it. Like I wasn't, you know, sometimes you'd be, feel a little hungry still after it didn't last. It didn't stick to your guts for super long as they would say. Yeah. And we weren't hardcore vegans. Like we no, were, no. we tried to make a priority to eat like vegan meals, like what, four, maybe five nights a week. Yeah. And so we weren't totally void. And it wasn't, it really honestly yeah. wasn't for I mean, obviously, we, yeah, we weren't opposed categorically to eating animals. Clearly, we're not now because we raise them for sale and we eat our own, like a lot of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't like we, animals should not be eaten, but to eat conventional animals, like stuff mm -hmm. that comes from a standard poultry house, a standard pig facility, a standard feedlot, that I am opposed to on, for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. And so at the time, we're like, well, we don't want to eat that, but I can't mm -hmm. afford 30 bucks a pound for whatever steak from the mm -hmm. local butcher that's organic. So, just don't eat well, it. One of the sad things was, so Sam had a coworker that had started giving him raw milk. Just, he owned like kind of a small dairy and just started, it was, he was, um, uh, raising milk for Chipotle. So it was a bit, so, I mean, it's not, 
the cleanest milk out there, but it's a lot cleaner than like your conventional mm -hmm. dairy, you know, because they have higher standards than than the average. And so he's just giving us milk straight out the tank. Um, and I didn't know like, oh, great, raw milk. I Cool. <laughs> I didn't know all the benefits of raw milk at the time. And so when we started doing this vegan diet, we stopped drinking the raw milk because milk's bad for you. <laughs> and oh my. now I just cringe when I think about it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah. And so <clears throat> I think it, we just kind of, kind of faded out of that just as I, as I started, again, started reading more books and just realized like, oh, there's a whole lot of, again, like with the, with Michael Pollan's book, like there's a whole lot of different diets out there and it's, there's not necessarily like one best that, you know what I mean? That, that everyone in the world needs to eat this yeah. way okay. for optimal yeah. health. And there's enough people out there saying that how animal products are really important. Mm -hmm. So right. yeah, thankfully we weren't in it long enough to see a lot of the health detriments that Can, you, you hear a lot yeah. of people talking about who are on long-term vegan diets. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any benefits? Uh, I mean, I don't know. My acne gets better if I'm not eating sugars, you I know, think just eating processed, food. processed stuff and sugar, you know? So see. I think the benefits would be mostly just because it was real food. Right. Yeah. You know, it all started out as a whole vegetable and got chopped up and cooked, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I could tell that right away for sure. Yeah, That's I, awesome. My skin was better. Yeah, we weren't like buying processed vegan foods. We no, were just making vegan. everything from scratch, right? Yeah. That's right. huge. So how long? How long oh, were you Oh, man, that? shoot, I don't oh. know. Man, it's amazing how the years blend together now. <laughs> I don't even know. A couple Less years. Than a year? Oh, a yeah, few that years. Might be, maybe. maybe. Eh, it's probably too long. Probably a year. It's all, it's all it all it's just, it's just blurs like there wasn't hard lines where we like stopped this and started that it, it was just, well so i was okay. in grad together i was in grad school for three years and so it was maybe yeah maybe a year and a half to two years while i was in grad school yeah, yeah. That's what, a long time. what did that transition from vegan to whatever what, what, what was next how'd you get there like what, what did that look like <sighs> i think you were just learning more about the, the animal products are not all bad categorically right um, and that your body actually needs fats, mm -hmm. you know, and, and there is such a thing as a good, healthy animal product. And I think also too, I'll, I'll say this at some point as well, um, that I realized, like, I also had some theological objections to veganism, honestly, because, you know, as mm -hmm. believers, like, I don't think that the Lord was wrong in giving his people like meat to eat, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, and, and like, I think I, you have to be careful there because like, uh, like it is, it's okay to eat meat. Like if, I mean, clearly we have some objections to how some meat is raised, but just as a category, all meat should not be eaten, period. Like, I, I, I can't see that biblically, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that was that was something that I kind of, you know, I had, I had to think through that a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. That was part of me realizing, like, this can't be the whole picture. You know what I mean? Um, and something I want to say real quick while I'm thinking about, Joey, because you kind of alluded to this, is like, where did you start? And I would say for someone who's listening to this um, and thinking, like, okay, how, this seems overwhelming to, like, my diet is this, and now you're telling me it needs to be some totally different, right? So let me just say now, so make sure we say it. If you're talking about getting into better, healthier food, the easiest thing to do is like start with the low hanging fruit, no pun intended, and just cut out the junk. Okay. Like that's just basic stuff. Like if you're eating a candy bar every day at work, just stop eating the candy bar, you know? And I say that like, it's easy. I get it. It's not necessarily, but like at bare minimum, before you start adding all the really healthy stuff that seems overwhelming, just don't eat the junk, right? Mm -hmm. Start with that. Then you can work up to things where like, okay, we used to eat it out of a box, but now we're going to, we're going to make it instead one day a week. And maybe we'll try to do two days a week in the future, right? But literally, mm -hmm. you got to start somewhere or you will not start. But start with the easy stuff and then just move into the harder things as you go. It doesn't have to be like a cold turkey thing. But there are some things that you can stop doing. Like I quit drinking sodas and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I started drinking sparkling waters, mm -hmm. which are, you know, relatively speaking, fine for you compared to a Coke, you know? Yeah. And that was, I felt better doing that. And it was clearly better for me and for my teeth, right? I don't want to pay for my own cavities. We don't have dental insurance. So just not drinking the soda saves me two bucks a day. And also I feel better. So that's a great starting point. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So for anybody who's kind of overwhelmed, just pick the low hanging fruit, get rid of the junk and then ease your way into the other stuff. It will come with time, right? It will come with time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would say over the same period, we started that work share at, yeah. 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 So it, yeah. It's, it's funny that Sam grew up doing a lot of the things that we are doing now, but just didn't necessarily carry those into his adulthood yeah. as a priority, but yeah. he had those in his back, those roots, pocket, you know, mm -hmm. in his roots yeah. Um, yeah. that really, I think serve us well now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think, yeah, at a certain point, his mom really wanted to buy us like a CSA share for a summer. Mm -hmm. And so while we started looking into CSA farms for the first time, we discovered there's this whole work share program thing. And so 
we found a farm that was 30 minutes from where we lived. Uh, this was 2017. This yeah. is when I was pregnant. This is when I was pregnant with yeah. my our first daughter. And uh, we started working there for two hours. We both worked for two hours a week, so four hours collectively. Um, and then we got um, for the over the course, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> over May to October. And when we got and we got a box of produce every week for mm. our time. And we worked there until we until moved. We moved. Yeah. Um, and they moved away from a box system and then just gave us credit um, after that first summer. And so then we got tons of free, organic, I mean, locally grown. Free for our time. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Two hours a week per person. So for a net four hours a week, we had more fresh vegetables than we could eat. And wow. we, ended up, we ended up processing and saving some, right? So, wow. I mean, that was, that was how one way that you take the financial aspect of it. Right. You can afford it when it's your time, right? Yeah. And so generally speaking, you know, uh, some people's situations have to work more hours. But for us, working a relatively normal, you know, 40, 50 hours a week, we were able to work that two hours in and, uh, and then had all that produce to show for it, right, without having to spend any money. Mm -hmm. And we started at the same time, we started looking into bulk, like um, buying, buying meat more in bulk. Mm hmm because we couldn't afford to buy, you know, from our, you know, our beautiful local co-op, you know, buy the ground beef was even, you know, 10 bucks a pound. Yeah. And so, you know, right. we just couldn't, you know, afford to buy, you know, the, the meat like that. Right. And so we started looking into bulk options for meat. And so really we start getting into like, okay, how can we eat well in an affordable way? Right. And I'll jump in here too. So another thing that motivated me as far as like why I was getting into some of this. There's a, there's a physical health track, right? I feel better. Mm -hmm. It's better for my body. Okay. But for me, some of it was principled as well, because as a conservative, and I use that word, not necessarily Republican, I, conservative in the classic sense. Okay. Yeah. So um, when you look at the way the food industry has become food, we got really, you got big pharma, big food and big government, and they're married to each other. Okay. Mm -hmm. And from a conservative perspective, I have concerns with that, right? I, I prefer small. I prefer small business. I prefer small government. I prefer small industry. And I prefer a very tightly woven social fabric, right, that isn't so connected um, or so dependent on a few large entities, right, mm -hmm. government or otherwise. So when you start supporting local farms, right, when I buy my beef from Jerry Marr, who lives an hour away from me, instead of buying it from Walmart, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a way in which I'm strengthening the social fabric, right? And I'm supporting something local. There's more accountability between me and him than there is between me and Walmart, obviously. And so um, for me, some of eating locally and eating healthy um, and trying to support local agriculture instead of big ag, quote unquote, um, was part of my principles as a conservative. And I saw a way for that to like work itself out in the way we did food, right? Mm -hmm. Among lots of other things, you know? And also I think too, you know, we're losing something as a society because we overvalue efficiency and we overvalue like getting things done as fast as possible, as cheap as possible. Right. So yes, we spend, and this is part of like what people want to know about our lifestyle. We spend a lot of time prepping food. Okay. Mm -hmm. For us, it has become what a lot of people would consider like our hobby time. Mm -hmm. Like we're doing that instead of golfing or instead of going to movies or instead of going sometimes fishing or whatever other people do, hunting, whatever. Like we spend a lot of time and it's as a family, but we chop a lot of food, we can a lot of food, we freeze a lot of food, we all of this stuff, right? So for me as a conservative, I think sometimes as a society, because we overvalue efficiency and just stuff being as cheap and quick as possible, that we have lost the art, if you will. And this, some of this is what I picked up from Michael Pollan as well, of like how to cook good food, mm -hmm. how to preserve our own food, how to have something on your shelf that didn't come from a box, right? And, and I think if we don't maintain that, um, we're going to lose something that's going to be very hard to get back, right? Yeah. This whole idea of like, how do you even, you know, raise your own food and preserve it and do all that stuff because we're so dependent on a, on a grocery store, right? And so I wanted to be, I wanted to be the kind of person that isn't super dependent on the local grocery store, having everything in stock for me at all times to be able to eat, you know what I'm saying? And I think mm -hmm. COVID for a lot of people, we were ahead of that curve, but I think COVID smacked a lot of people upside the head and they realized like, whoa, you know, mm -hmm. we live in a very fragile food system. And, uh, and we, you know, even before COVID were realizing like we want to be able to be more self-reliant on food. Mm -hmm. Totally. Sorry, I that, wanna... was that, was, <laughs> no. that was a long rabbit trail. Sorry. That was great. I want to get into 
like you mentioned, just some of the details and you don't have to share specific numbers, but I know for us, I think I did the math and we spend, so I think now the average American spends less than 10% of their household income on mm. food, or it used to be closer to 40% mm -hmm. in the early yeah. 1900s. We do the math. Mm -hmm. We yeah. do, I think around 21 to 25% of our household income on food. It is our second highest bill. Mm -hmm. Our only higher bill is our mortgage. Yeah. Yep, and even correct. on sometimes like months where we are hosting for multiple weeks, our food will supersede our mortgage. So um, you don't have to give grocery numbers, but if you want to give a percentage, I just think that's helpful. Because even if it, it's a ballpark. Yeah, even if it's a ballpark because it helps prioritize. I want people to know that when they're on this real food journey, there are ways you can pull the different levers of time and money. I know you're pulling the lever of time by food mm -hmm. prepping, yep. and you can also pull the lever of money. So that's right. give us kind of how, how you right. guys break that down. Well, I'm, so I'm looking at my calculator right now. Um, I think for us, so our food budget right now, it's tricky so because- Does this include like what the farm- Well, that's what I was going to say. And everything. It's, we're in a different situation now than true. we were when yeah. we were buying from farm, when we were buying all our food. Yeah. yeah. Because now we are producing mm -hmm. the majority chunking. of our food. But we also have input costs for that. So let me just answer this question as if it was two years ago, okay. which I think probably, probably for most of our, you know, our listeners- they're not on a 37, you know, 36 acre farm with a bunch yeah. of their own animals. So let's yeah. say we were not in that situation, right? Our food budget for a family of five was around a thousand bucks a month. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's, I could go back and give you exact numbers, but it's about that much. Okay. And that includes all things that we consume. So that includes our snacks. If we buy like a bag of chips or something, it mm -hmm. includes um, like if I go and buy a six pack of local beer, it goes into our food budget. Right. Yep. Um, so there's some things in there that are, you know, like not really what we're eating per se, but it's all stuff we consume. It's still wrapped up in that money. Okay. And like you guys, it is our second highest expense for sure. But what I, what always amazes people is that, you know, they look at that number and it seems very expensive to go buy $10 a gallon milk, which we do, right? Our mm -hmm. organic milk is 10 bucks. But what I try to tell raw people, milk, it's raw, not raw organic milk, milk. Sorry, I'm sorry. I said <laughs> raw. What I try to tell people to do is look at it on a per meal basis. Okay. Yeah. So if you eat, um, and we don't really eat out much, okay? Mm -hmm. So let's just assume between eating at, you know, my mother-in-law's a couple times a month and maybe eating out once a month, you know, we're going to be eating 95% of our own meals at home, right? And so, you know, if you do a thousand bucks a month divided by approximately, let's call it 610 meals a month, okay? Uh, servings, like plates of food, because there's five of us, mm -hmm. you're talking about eating for about a buck 65 a serving, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's local predominantly organic, fresh food for less than you can buy junk food for at McDonald's, okay? Mm. So we are not pulling the money lever as much as it seems. We're pulling the time lever, okay? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we could go take a family right now of five to McDonald's and it would be 20 something dollars. Yeah. But when we cook for ourselves, including the drinks we drink and maybe the snacks we have before dinner, you know, we're talking about eating for like $9, yeah. right? Really well. And so on a per meal basis, it really doesn't seem that overwhelming. But one of the ways we pull that off is, as Brett said, we did a work share and we also did bulk meat purchases. So the difference there is, you know, we're going to buy a half a cow, for instance, right? Well, half a cow might cost you a thousand dollars, but on a per pound basis, it's way cheaper to buy a half a cow than it is to buy a, a cut of meat at the grocery store multiple times a week or multiple mm -hmm. times a month. You just have to have the thousand bucks once a year, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where people have to be able to budget to the point where they've got the cash to make the big purchase once a year instead of a bunch of little purchases, you know, 12 times a year. But when you break it down per pound, it's so much more affordable. And that's part of the way we've been able to eat meat. I mean, when we were cleaning out the freezer before this last beef, we had a whole bunch of filet mignon in the bottom of the freezer. We <laughs> ate filet mignon, I kid you not, three or four days that week. We just cooked it because we were using it up. We had $75 worth of filet mignon that week, just on a Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night <laughs> for nine total dollars, right? That's yeah, amazing. Yeah. Because we bought it in bulk. So that's that's part of how we've done it is you got to buy in bulk and you got to be willing to put the time in to either do the, do the veggie stuff or you got to take the time in to buy stuff as basic ingredients and then prep it yourself. Because as soon as you buy something that's processed or pre-made, mm -hmm. you've added somebody else's time, which means the cost has gone up. Yes. And so now your per meal cost goes much higher. Right. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. really humorous when we moved from Wisconsin to Tennessee. We have one, we have five, five freezers. Good size freezers. So that was our condition for any moving company that moved us. It's that you need to be able to move our 
five full freezers of meat. Like no, oh. yeah, no exceptions. We had a big trailer. We <laughs> unloaded them, loaded them in the trailer, put them all back in. We moved in the winter time when it was very cold, okay. and we closed the lids full of frozen food. And we said, "You got to drive straight through." And then when we get there, we'll immediately unload them and plug them right back in. <gasps> right. And so Jeez. I want them. If they had stayed overnight somewhere, I was going to make them plug them in wherever they stayed. But they said we'll drive straight through. And, uh, and then we just won't open them until we get there. It was like 12 hours. So it was not a big deal. But yeah, we have five freezers. And, and that's one thing that, you know, some people don't have this. In our apartment, we did not have the space. So, you know, we would have had to stuff a freezer in a closet or something. So there are yeah. limitations. If you're going to buy a half a beef, it's a lot of space, right? Yeah. But you'd be surprised all the places you can get creative to put a, you know, a seven cubic foot chest freezer that you mm -hmm. bought for 50 bucks on Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. And just tuck it away somewhere. And, and then you can buy you can buy more stuff at one time. The time versus money matrix is something that is you guys have clearly really figured out. And it's so cool to talk to somebody that's free. We've talked about that a number of times. And I feel like we've just absolutely butchered it and I'm trying to really explain it. But th there, it's so interesting to see how, and I love the dynamic of like, yeah, there's some sacrifices we make on the time side. It's not like, mm -hmm. it's not like, hey, in my extra spare time, I save money for food. It's like you, you, you said it yourself. You know, some of it's our hobby time. Right. Mm -hmm. You might be, you only have so much time in your life, right? You have time capital and you have financial capital, right? Yep. And I'm spending that capital where my buddies are going out golfing or, you know, hey, right. like so and so is running out. They're going out to, you know, uh, get our nails done, whatever it could be, right? And it's like we're in the kitchen and I'm, we're, we're making sauerkraut and we're yep. chopping up, you know, four gigantic heads of cabbage and, you know, weighing out, you know, grams of salt, right? Yep. Or you're, or you're, you know, sitting down and you're like, experiencing a cash flow crunch for a specific period of time because you went out and spent a thousand dollars on the half you know mm -hmm. side of beef right and putting in your freezer so that you can have that more affordable meat right uh, or, or you make your family sit at home by themselves for a long time while you go out and hunt deer mm. and and um and and <laughs> try to fresh yep. And yep. try to, that's very sacrificial of you man i feel it it's hard that's, right you know it's really tough all on me day. oh geez yeah Gosh. All your wife's in her warm house with her three kids snuggling. Yes, yeah. having cocoa. Under, Underappreciated, man. Thank you. Snuggling. Thank you. Yeah. Oh you God. know what? It's funny because like I could list off like it takes time to meal plan, sit down and meal plan. It takes time to learn how to feed your family mm -hmm. well. Right. Let's not even talk about the research that you have to put mm -hmm. in. It takes time. And even when you're talking about buying things from the grocery store. I love that you're like the moment it becomes sliced and diced, it's a different product. That's why I'm such an advocate of buying a whole chicken. Like the mm -hmm. moment that chicken is butchered, you're losing your cost per unit. Like it's going up slightly. And it's mm -hmm. like You mean broken down and segmented uh -huh. out? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Not not that I never buy that if I'm making something specific, but like in general, the wholer and more naturally occurring I can get it, the better. So yeah, mm -hmm. this this time versus money is good. It's also always a hard conversation because there's always people who want to tell us, I don't have time and I don't have money. And I'm mm -hmm. like, I understand that, but like you do, and you might have a little time and a little mm -hmm. money, but you have mm -hmm. some of something. Mm -hmm. And it's not like Joey and I are um, trust fund babies, you know, like we got married. We were really, we Dude, lived one in one minute rice scary. packets and mm -hmm. the, we lived in a scary apartment I and we hunt, had a dog so nice. already. I did, I've always kind of hunted, which has been a nice. Yeah, little, little... we've all, we've always been like the young married couple with kids, and um, you know, it's just it's hard. I feel for families who are in that tight spot, mm -hmm. and you got to yeah. figure out how Agreed. to leverage 100%. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. been hard for us moving into a very rural area where you know, coming from Madison, where people prioritize like quality food in general, to a very poor rural area mm -hmm. where you know. Walmart's or Dollar know. General even. Oh yeah, Dollar Generals. Oh my goodness. <laughs> kind of a kind of a grocery store for a lot of folks. Yes. Right? Wow. And you know. Imagine what you buy at Dollar General. Right? Yeah, that's food. hard. Do they even have yeah. fridges? Like uh they got sort of like a fridge section, you know, kind of oh, thing. God. But, yeah. Yeah. Sour cream there, I've gotten I have gone there and bought sour cream in a pinch. Yes. Yeah, because oh. when you you live early and you need something I will admit in a that. pinch. Yes. I have. I have. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's for sure. And we've run into trouble along the way, which most people who get into the healthy food world um, go through a phase where you become a big jerk, right? Because you realize how healthy this all this food is. You're like, wow, everyone else is wrong. Y'all are stupid for eating bad. You're ruining yourself and your kids. We are clearly better people than you for eating healthier. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? 
And so we went through that phase. We damaged relationships because Mm. we made dumb jokes Mm. about their food that they were feeding us at their house when they were busy and they wanted to take us in and show us hospitality. And we were dumb enough to say stupid things about their food. So lots of regrets in that first phase, right? So you got to be super careful that this does not become something where you are, you know, judging other people in an unhelpful way for their food decisions. We've always tried to advocate for it positively versus just telling everybody else, you know, you're stupid. Um, but to your point, yes, th- there are some situations where the time is that tight or the money is that tight that it's just very hard to do it the way that we do it. And I totally get that, but, um, there always, there is always time. Right. Mm-hmm. And so some of that is becomes like a values issue, you know, like for us, we virtually watch literally like no TV ever. Right. Um, and some people like for them, that's, they want that time to sit with their family and watch TV. I mean, we watch one movie a night or a week on Sundays, right? We have fun family movie night Sundays and that's it, you know, but think of all the time that we could be watching TV when we're chopping liver or we're canning tomatoes or whatever. Like we have just chosen that that's not what we do. Like we just mm-hmm. don't do that. You know what I mean? Um, and so there are things that you can give up that are sacrificial to make this happen. And some, for some folks, like they don't want to go as far as we have, and that's totally fine. Right. Mm-hmm. But there's some ground in the middle there where right. there is always time for what is important. And, and, you know, we make it a family experience, right? So like as a very concrete example, I stayed home with the younger two last night when Brett went to Thanksgiving dinner, cause we're fighting the sickness. Mm-hmm. So during that time we were playing, we alternated between playing games of Mancala and chopping up livers. Like literally we would play a game of Mancala and I would chop a liver. And then we play a game of Mancala and I would chop a liver. And they were sitting at the counter with me, right? And we were eating some popcorn before we chopped the liver. Relax, everyone. And, and it was a family activity, right? Like I was doing something with my kids. They were helping me put yeah. it in the bags and, and seal it up. But we made that, like that was what we were doing. But we did it as a family because if you don't do this as a family, then by all means, this is going to be something that like takes away from time with your kids. you got to incorporate mm-hmm. them into it. Um, otherwise, Yes, it could be, it, then it becomes a problem, right? You're doing, it yeah. takes too much time. So you got to get, you got to include them in what you're doing. And by no means are we perfect at this. We were just kind of going back and forth this morning about like, are we, are our to-do list just so weighed down that we have no margin just to be present with each other as a family? Right. And but so, a lot of that's the farm though, right? A lot of that is the farm. The farm takes a lot yeah. of time. Yeah. When we lived, you know, on a quarter acre suburban lot, we had a lot more margin in our lives. So, mm-hmm. well, okay. So I always love this. This is like talking to someone after they've had kids. Cause you, you're all of a sudden like, why did I think I was busy before I had kids? Like, what did I do with all my time? <laughs> so I want to hear from your perspective. You are on a farm now. We are yep. in the suburbs. Yep. If you could tell yourselves to like an encouraging note of your suburban past life, what would you say of like, dude, enjoy the time where you don't have to go like feed the chickens or milk the cow or whatever. What would be your like right. words of wisdom now that you're hindsight, you're looking hindsight? Well, you do have more time. It doesn't feel like it. You know what yeah. I mean? And mm-hmm. there's always things to do. Don't get me wrong. Um, but you de- we definitely have more time or we had more time to do what you wanted to do, right? Mm-hmm. You might still be doing something productive with it. Like in Madison, I like to keep our yard up really nice. So I was like putting, I was always putting in edging and like trimming <laughs> and weed. You know what I'm saying? Because yes. I've had the time and I wanted to be productive outside. Now I am forced to do things whether I want to or uh, not because it's a farm and it has to be done, right? Yeah. So I was still busy then. It's just I was selectively busy. Now I'm obligation busy, right? Mm-hmm. So I would say, yeah, like you're going to get – if you did move to a farm, you would have less time to do what you want to do. So, you know, use your time well now but know that you have more of it, you know, mm-hmm. what I mean? to, to pick and choose, right? Um, but – Busy on a farm isn't necessarily bad. It can be if you exclude your family, as we were just discussing, it can be a problem. But if you bring your family into it, then, you know, it just means that you're doing farm stuff together versus going for a walk together. Like we don't hike as much as we used to. Like we used to go to state parks all the time and hike for the day. Now we go out here and we weed or we cut, you know, fence rows or we move pigs or something. Like we're still together as a family, but we're not doing as much what I would call recreating. And yeah, it's a lot more right. just work, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. We have more, more of our time now is productive time than leisure time. Yeah, for sure. Is what so yeah, kind of if we were back in the city again, I'd probably go to more state parks and go on more like go to places that are hard to do when you have a farm later because you're just tied up. Mm-hmm. And Sam's also joked every child that we've had, he's had to drop a hobby. <laughs> That's right. yeah. That's right. Sad. Um, yeah, Sorry. no, I, I think 
the recreation time is always interesting. Who was it that was just saying like nowadays, was it one of our podcast guests? They were like, nowadays they want you to pay for everything. They want you to pay to put your kids in sports. They want you to pay to da, 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 go to a nice school. And he's like, we just get our kids on the farm and like, we don't have to pay for soccer practice, but our kids are out there learn- learning these real skills right. of being active and mobile. Right. Like, oh, that's really good. That's probably... Right more in alignment with my family values too. So right. I think that's, that's really cool. Well, and I'll, I'll say this as well. When we were in Madison, like we were not farming on a quarter acre, but we had a chicken coop, right? Oh. And we had mm, th- three or four garden boxes, you know? Um, and so like we, with the very small amount of space we had, we were doing something. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. you know, a couple buckets of raspberries is better than no raspberries. Yeah. Four eggs a day is better than no eggs a day. Right. So we were just doing a little bit of what we could plus the work share at the, at the farm to make it so that, you know, we were, we were doing the best we could to produce something for ourselves. Right. Mm, and like that. you said here a second ago, we want our kids to have like hard skills, right? Like I want my, okay. like my five-year-old now she's six. She can drive a four wheeler very comfortably, right? Like mm. obviously within limitations, we get that, but like she can ride a four wheeler, you know, mm-hmm. and she helped me change the transmission oil in the tractor the other day. Like these are real skills that I want my kids to have. Cause I remember now, especially looking back, how much of that I learned and how much I appreciate my childhood on a small hobby yeah. farm. I really wanted that for my kids. It's a big part of why we moved to a farm is because it's getting harder and harder for kids to have that, you know, hands on in the dirt, learning by doing like stuff. You know what I mean? And I want my kids to be able to do stuff outside with tools, with animals and that kind of thing. And, you know, and learn that stuff by doing it and getting dirty and being, <laughs> And I think even more than just the skills that you gained from your upbringing, you gained this mindset of being able to figure things out. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's a big difference between Sam and I is that I have a harder time kind of putting my, Mm -hmm. you know, my mind down and like, you know, wanting figuring stuff. I I, I just can't figure it out. And Sam's just like, well, I'm just going to mess with it until I figure it out. I'm going to find some way. I'm going to YouTube some way. And I think some of that comes from, you know, growing up on that hobby farm and just dealing with so many different, you know, problems and just different, right. yeah, just different things you have, you have to deal with on a farm that have to be. Right. And that's not to say you can't get that in the city. We're not saying city kids are dumb. Okay. Please don't hear me say that. But you're exposed to a lot of things when you have a farm and animals yeah. and equipment and all that stuff that like, it's just, you know, you have to figure a lot of stuff out. So mm-hmm. I love mm-hmm. that. So there's there's something that's been on my mind a lot lately, and I, I love this conversation because, Brett, there's so many wives out there that are in this journey right now that are just, man, if if I could just get my husband on board like Sam is, <laughs> and um, you know, Sam's laughing because he's probably like, yeah, I mean, it's I, real. And, it's and, real. and I'm feeling somewhat like I don't know what you would call it, frustrated, a little bit like. I wish men ch- would just grow up and be men. I'm wanting to challenge people Honestly. more. I just, I, I don't know. The way that I was raised is very high challenge from like a, you know, fatherly male kind of, <laughs> you know, people in my life that that, yeah. that kind of built into me. It was always less of like a, you know, it's okay. You know, it was more of like, hey, like, what are you doing? You know what I mean? And and so maybe that's the wrong approach. But sometimes I just want to like <laughs> talk to guys and be like, hey, do you not? do you not care at all? Like, do you not want to be on the same team as your, as your wife is? And maybe there's people out there that, that there's husbands and, and I'm, I'm sure there, there are um, that man, I, if I could just get my wife on board, I'd love to talk to you because I haven't talked to very many of those. Right. Um, uh, anyhow, would love to know along the way, as you guys have been doing this, uh, what bumps in the road did you guys encounter as much as you want to share? Um, mm-hmm. I, I have to imagine there's been some, I mean, geez, I've been on board as long as I can remember. And there have definitely been moments where Elizabeth and I've kind of locked horns a little bit and be like, you know what? We, we need to chew on this thing a little bit. He brought home canola oil. Well, uh, like two years ago. And I was like, what are you doing? Was that two years ago? Maybe, it had to be longer than that. Maybe three. It was pretty recent. Anyhow. I was like, no, in the garbage. The, it's true. This happened. Um, and, and to preface it, cause I feel like I need to defend myself here. Um, I went to culinary school, and and so I was a chef, and canola oil is just what we used. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not what right. we used. And it was not three years ago. Get out of here. It this was pre COVID for sure. Anyways, I want to hear how you guys sort this out, husband and wife style. Right, right. You first. Well, the biggest thing I can think of is the financial aspect. When I want to make a shift, or you know, mm-hmm. I'm paying the credit card bill, and you know, he's, he's like, "What? Well, what was that on there?" <laughs> Right. Um, and so 
there are, t- you know, I'd say for most things, we do have a mutual trust in our relationship and mm-hmm. Sam understands how much research and how much time I put into the decisions that we make for our family. And I think as wives, like we are the, we carry that main weight of speaking specifically in our relationship for sure. Yeah. This may not be the case, right? But, but yeah. Going. Of, you know, how we, how we nourish our families yeah. in both what we eat and what we put on our bodies and just, you know, mm-hmm. and, and making our home in general. And in general, I think women put a lot of time and energy into that. Mm-hmm. And so, and I think Sam recognizes that and then, and, and trusts me to make those decisions. And when I'm investing in something, he knows that they're, that I didn't just do it on a whim that we've mm-hmm. built up that trust that he can trust me in that. Uh, and then there are times where, you know, he's like, Oh, that, that, that's kind of a pricey switch. You know, that's, you know, double the cost or triple the cost of what we were, uh, paying for the, whatever equivalent product before, or, you know, something brand new. And then I'll, you know, need to explain that to him. And usually after, you know, I explain my reasoning, it's like, okay, I get it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I wouldn't say it's very often where, I mean, I, I was laughing about your episode, your EMF episode on, you were talking about the Soma Vedic. I did bring yeah. home one of those a couple of years ago and that one went back. <laughs> yeah. It was a pricey one. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. but it, yeah, but in general, I, that's the main thing I think of is the financial pushback as far as bumps in the road. And yeah. Can you think of anything else? No, I, I would agree with that. Cause and part of that's because I, I'm the one that does the budget, right? So I sit down with the receipts and put everything in at the end of the month and all that. So, um, I, uh, I don't like the end of the month. It gets really stressful. <laughs> there, there are, most of our bumps have been like, that was really expensive, but to Brett's point, it's not because she did it on a whim. Yeah. You know, so if we buy a, whatever, make it up $40 bottle of shampoo instead of a $2 bottle of shampoo, like there was a reason for that. Right. Right. And, and we're fortunate, you know, I have a good job. And so we're not, she's never spending more money than we have. Okay. Ever. That's not an issue. So it's not like she's out there racking up credit card debt to do this. Okay. Um, it's just within the world of discretionary income. Like I probably wouldn't have bought that bottle of shampoo, but I know she has a reason for that. She, she clearly thought it through. And so I, I get behind on that. You know what I mean? Um, and so for us, it's been mostly financial, but usually that's me just learning why after the fact versus, you know, um, talking it through in the moment. And, and I would say too, um, some of it, I think some of the push pull with us a little bit has been, like in the world of health and natural food, like you could be, and you could make like uh, an idol out of this and b- become like a control thing where you are yeah. doing your best to live to 90 and be in perfect health and never die. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, right. we know that's not possible. And so you could make the, this thing where you become a bit of a control freak um, and you're trying to become immortal with what you eat and you ruin your family's lives and lives of people around you because you're like, you're paranoid. Okay. Yeah. You can't be paranoid. And so there's been a few times I would say where I have had to sort of gently sort of pull back on bread a little bit and just remind like, this stuff is important. We should try to take care of our bodies. It's a stewardship issue, right. but we can't live forever because we eat gluten-free yeah. or whatever. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. 100%. Um, and, and there's a bit of a moderation there. I think I provided to Brett um, and vice versa. She has pulled me from thinking like, okay, it doesn't really matter that much. Like, yeah, actually it does matter. So like we've worked together to sort of find that healthy space where you're not trying to control everything and be paranoid but you also do give a hoot and you're, you're trying to do the best you can. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Our motto with our, our farm is that we are seeking to steward our land and our animals and our family uh, to the best of our ability in order to nourish our family and nourish our community. Mm-hmm. And so on our, right. on my best days, I'm having that mindset of stewardship. Yeah. And then on my worst days, I'm getting, you know, paranoid. Cause again, you know, you see often, yeah, in the health and wellness world, they're always talking about how everything is going to kill you. Mm -hmm. And so you get in this mindset of, well, if I do the right things, then, you know, I'm not going to get cancer. I'm not going to get heart disease, but it's like, we we are all going to die. Mm -hmm. But there's a part of ourselves that are just fighting so hard against that. And some of that, I, I think if we were honest with ourselves, there's a lot of us that are, trying to eat healthy in order not to die. <laughs> and we know that's ridiculous, but, but I think, I think that, yeah. you know, if we look really deep down that that is what is driving us forward. Right. And so doing that heart check 
on a, really on a daily basis. So like, what is my core motivation? Is my motivation stewardship of these life of, you know, the life that the Lord has given us? Or am I trying to make myself immortal mm-hmm. by, you know, right. the foods that we right. eat or, you know, right. the products we put on our body? And right. so you got, yeah, you got to do the best you can without being paranoid. Right. Yeah. I mean, I got a shop full of cleaning supplies, like brake cleaner and 80, 90 weight gear oil and all that mm-hmm. stuff is horrible for you. Right. So like I come inside, I eat healthy food, but like there is a bit of a reality check of like, I can't avoid all chemicals ever because I have a tractor who takes yeah. diesel, you know what I mean? Yeah. And grease, you know? So I, I mean, you got to do the best you can. Right. And the, mm-hmm. we want to be as healthy as we can, as long as the Lord gives us life. And whether it's when I'm 35 or 95, when the Lord takes me home, I, I want to feel as good as I can until then. But ultimately like it's, it's not entirely in my control, you know? how i how i feel and how i go you know what i mean mm-hmm. but we will so do the best good. we can as much as we can control it reasonably well right i think that that family that that husband wife alignment is just so good and man, I, I really hope that people are listening to this can, you can getting getting that getting everybody rowing in the same direction yeah getting mm-hmm. both of the leaders on the same like team going the same way is key right because at the end of the day what I'm hearing is not so much that uh, and we're both pulling different directions here, but that and we're both going the same way mm-hmm. and we both have brains to figure out how to get there the best possible way. Mm-hmm. Right. And yeah. so there might be a day where, you know, Brad's coming to say, like, Hey, you know what? I think I've, I've been, I've been tinkering with this thing and I feel like we could really do better here. If we, if we just, you know, spend some extra time or if I, if I shift these, you know, these, these puzzle pieces around and that thing's going to fit a little bit nicer. And, and Sam's like, Oh, well that's, a, that's, I totally agree. That's amazing. Or she's going to come to him and say, hey, you know, I've been shifting these pieces around and like everything's not completely fitting the way that it should be. And because Sam's invested, he's like, hey, well, let's, let's talk about that together, right? right. Let's, and, and it's like you get extra eyes on it and things go, go super smooth. And right. I think what Brett was saying, and, and, I, and again, I agree with Sam, I don't think everybody in the world, the, the mother or the wife is, is carrying the, the whole burden. I think that does happen a lot. And, but mm-hmm. what I would say is whoever's carrying that burden of nourishment and health and you know uh like when do we make the decision to go to the doctor and when do we make mm-hmm. the decision to try to fix this on our own and when do we make the decision to um you know take the medicine or right. or or you know buy the food that we we weren't buy whoever's whoever's carrying that burden right man you, are you just letting them do that by themselves right yeah like right. you're you don't want to support that like what, what whoever whoever it is and and so i think man uh, what a huge, like powerful unit that becomes and disagreements are good as long as you're going the same direction, right? Mm-hmm. right. Disagreements yep. are good. And so it's like, you know, there, there's, there's gonna be moments where even like just today where it's like, Hey, I think this is what we should do to get this tick off of Ruthie's throat. It's like, oh, I think this is what we should do. And it's like, man, at some point having outside opinions helps you see things through multiple lenses so you can make the best decision possible. Mm-hmm. And so, right. uh, yeah, I, I really love that. And man, I, I just want to keep continuing can continue as a man. I want to continue to challenge other men out there that are listening to right. this that yeah. man, get on board. And would, I'm yeah. not saying carry the weight. I'm saying I'm saying, you know, appreciate how much weight your spouse is carrying mm-hmm. and everything she's doing for you and for mm-hmm. your family. And what can you do to support it? It doesn't mean just lay down and say, Yep, spend all of our money, you know, to, to, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm saying I'm saying watch the video, listen to the podcast, read the book, mm-hmm. sit down on the couch and have coffee together and talk through different challenges and situations and use your brain and the strategic input that you can give to make those things, those options, those opportunities, those challenges, make them better. Right. What would you say to a husband who diverts to the classic phrase, just trust the expert? Mm. Oh boy. <laughs> Cause that's, oh, which, which, I which, see what? that a lot. Which expert? And what? Any expert, expert the FDA, year? the EPA, right. uh, the CDC, your <laughs> doctor, your, uh, whoever, like, right. what do you say when the wife right. is, is leaning in to, to mm-hmm. maybe right. so <laughs> that conversation? That was a struggle for me because there was a time where I was like, okay, so you're reading a bunch of mommy blogs and now we're going to change our whole way of life. Mm-hmm. Right. That and is going to be more expensive. Yeah. So tell me more about that. You know, <laughs> not um, reading mommy plus. That's how I felt in my mind. Okay. Do you understand? <laughs> I, what I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm you. Stereotyping. Yeah. That's good. I'm serious. Same. Okay. Yeah. So um, I would say, oh man, there's you could a lot unpack a lot here. So the question is, when I say which experts, there's there's a lot of experts, right? Are we talking about the experts right now? The experts from two years ago? The experts mm. from ten years ago? The experts from twenty years ago? That's good. Because guess what? They all say different things. Okay. Yes. And also, they're all financially connected to each other. 
And they've got a big interest in you buying as many drugs and as much cheap food as you possibly can. So if that's the expert, by golly, let's listen to them and keep giving them our money uh, and still feel horrible, right? So I would say there's, you got to think critically more like, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist, okay? And I'm not saying that everybody that works for Pfizer or everybody that works for Monsanto is out there to get you. But Mm -hmm. let's be very honest about where the money is at and what are the incentives that those companies have. And generally, it's not your health, okay? It's um, it's profits, which is fine. I'm, I'm not a... I'm not anti-business, right? But let's just be honest about like, what are they trying to do and how does that connect to your family's health? And are they, are they aligned, you know? And honestly, like the data changes all the time, right? And so when we say, talk to the experts about it, there's so much competing data and it's changing data that I, it's just hard to say like, you know, just because the CDC says or the FDA says or whatever, that something is healthy and good, that it's actually healthy and good. I just read something the other day about some ingredient and some soda that they said was just fine, the FDA did. And now they're like, actually that causes whatever this host of issues was and we're gonna, we're gonna have to walk it back. Well, six months ago, you said it was fine for me to drink that and now you're telling me it's gonna give me cancer. So what gives, you know? Yeah. And at the end of the day, there's so much wisdom in just how things used to be in a very basic way. Like, you know, people for hundreds of years, thousands of years have been eating meat, eggs, vegetables and being for the most part, just fine, right? Like. And, and all of a sudden now, because we have all these drugs and we have all these special ways of processing our food and all that, like somehow we're supposed to be better and yet we're actually not as healthy. So here we are, the experts said, and now we're, we're actually worse off than we were in a lot of ways before. So I'm just very skeptical that like the experts are as smart as they say they are, to mm-hmm. be honest with you. And that their best interest is my family's health. And, you know, so, um, but I understand the, I understand the argument because there's a lot of wacky information on the internet. So just totally. because you read something on the internet does not mean jack squat. Okay. Mm-hmm. If it's reputable, if it's validated, if it's something that, you know, was published by a credible publisher, that makes more sense to me than just a blog somewhere. Okay. So there's this fine line between like the experts say over here and then like a bunch of crazy people say over here. And where do you find this middle space of like reasonable data that you can work from? Right. Um, but a lot of it just comes down to some basic common sense of like, if, if you can't pronounce the ingredients and it's full of chemicals, it's probably not good for you, no matter what the FDA says, mm-hmm. right? And if it's a carrot and it's fresh and whole, even if the expert says it's not good for you because it doesn't have this or that enhanced vitamin or whatever, it's probably actually pretty good for you. It just came out of the ground 10 seconds ago, you know? Mm-hmm. So you, you got to find that common sense, reasonable middle space between the two extremes. Right. Yeah. Um, and to your point too, Joy, I, I would absolutely agree with you on that. If your wife, because I agree, the ma- the vast majority of these journeys happen because the wife is doing something, you know, some research or some reading or encounter something, whatever, and the husband gets drug along. But by golly, man, like you said, if your wife is genuinely trying to pursue better health for you and your family and your kids, so that when you're 65, you're not obese and have cancer, yeah. right? Like get behind that. My goodness. Like who wouldn't want that? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Even if it requires some lifestyle change for you, you got to give up your Mountain Dews or whatever, like get on board with somebody that wants to help you feel better. And has a vested interest in your long-term well-being because the 65 or 70 year old version of you is going to thank the 30 year old version of you when you realize later, like that, that was actually really good to do that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So yes, get on board, support your wife, appreciate the hard work that she's doing. And you know, and, uh, and you'll thank yourself later, honestly. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me just say for a minute too, for the men, because I think it's confusing why it's all very often female driven. I think Brett's story is a perfect example that in general, women are harmed by expert advice more often than men are and from an early age. So having symptoms and immediately being put on pharmaceutical birth control, having a pregnancy and listening to traditional obstetricians, going through a birth experience in a hospital versus with a trained midwife um, in a natural setting, um, having children who are sick and you follow everything the pediatrician tells you and they're sicker and they're sicker, And it's the wife, the mom in general, who is face to face with every single time that Mm -hmm. expert advice turns around and slaps us. And then we are stuck by ourselves on an island and everyone's just yelling at us, trust the expert. And we have to, we have to be brave enough to say, listen, I did that. And it, 
these are the questions I still have unanswered. So if you are my spouse, can you please go on this journey of answering these questions with me? Right. Because right. that is why women have this intense burden because we have faced it up close, sometimes tragically so. We like people have lost children or we we've lost our own health or we it's just I really feel it, feel for women in that position because that's why we're driving the ship is not because mm -hmm. we just want to be rogue and be our own leaders. It's right. because we've been harmed by expert advice right. and we are trying to get to the bottom of that. Mm -hmm. So that's right. all. Yeah. We know our own children. Yeah. The yeah. best out of anyone. Yeah, right, our own right. bodies. My yeah, goodness. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. so I would, yeah. To your point, if you're going to trust the expert, who is more of an expert on my three children than <laughs> us, especially my wife who spends all of her time with them every day. Like yes. there's no way you can tell me that someone that wrote a book, who now lives in some other state 20 years ago, working for the CDC, knows my child better than my wife does. That's insane, right? Yeah. No matter how many degrees that guy says he has. So my wife is the expert on our children. If you want to trust mm -hmm. the expert, you can ask her. She'll tell you mm -hmm. what we're going to do, right? Um, and so, yes, I 100% agree. And I think it's God-given, too, that women care deeply for their well-being and their children's well-being. Yeah. Part of their God-given responsibilities as mom, right? And so we should definitely lean into that. And like you mentioned, um, you know, birth and that kind of thing. We So we're home birthers as well. Also driven by my wife, of course, mm -hmm. but I got on board with that. And now I'm as much of an advocate for that as she is, because it turns out that for the whole family, it's been a much better experience, right? Yep. And so um, I think part of what COVID really highlighted this for a lot of people as well. But I think a lot of people, um, when they say trust what the experts say, it's what they're saying is trust the experts because you're too dumb to make a decision for yourself. Yeah. Um, and honestly, that's just hogwash, right? Like mm -hmm. you're not too dumb to make a decision for yourself. You might be if you don't think at all, but that would be your fault for not thinking, right? But like yeah. you can decide things for yourself. You can figure things out for yourself. Like there doesn't have to be this very small group of elites that can tell everybody what to do because they're smarter than the rest of us, mm -hmm. allegedly. You can think for yourself, make your own decisions, figure your own things out. You are far more capable than... A lot of people would like you to think you are like having a birth in our living room instead of a hospital. Like you can do that. People have been doing that for a long time. Turns out, you know, turns out <laughs> like we would like people to feel empowered for lack of a better word or an yes. overused word to make these decisions and yes. do these things because like you can do that. You're a, you're an, a fully functioning adult human being with a brain. Like there's a lot you can do for yourself. You know, I love that. A mission we have with, with this podcast, with, with our voices, with, with any opportunity that God gives us is to be out there and to instill confidence in people. Because I think yeah. that's one of the things that people yeah. are losing these days is the mm -hmm. ability to be confident Definitely. in their own decision making, especially yeah. when it comes to health and nutrition. Yeah. And it's, it's um, I mean, the, the, I mean, every media source around us is so heavily dominated by things that are essentially telling us to, you know, follow, the, follow this trend or this thing. Or, and, and it's like, man, I don't want anyone to listen to another person ever again and to trust their own gut, to find their own information, to problem solve. I mean, there's so many situations where, man, your tractor breaks down. Are you, are you calling somebody every single time? Well, you might first try to figure it out. And right. when it, when it, when it supersedes your confidence and your ability to understand that thing. Yeah. You may, maybe you call some help in, right? Cause like I got to get this tractor going, right? Like I need, I need it. It's the same thing for our kids and for our health and for ourselves. Right. It's like, man, so-and-so fell and their arm feels weird. It's like, okay, well, like, does it hurt when I push here? Does it hurt when I push here? I, I, there's some things that I can do that I don't right. believe in my heart. Like, you if, have to go get the extra. Yeah, it's like well, I'm not gonna, I'm not rushing you off to the ER. Like, you're, you're not. You're, there's no like, you know, if we're hemorrhaging, blood, <laughs> like, if right. if uh, if our if we if we have a fever that's going multiple days, we just can't get it down. And we don't understand why. Like, there, um, this is me saying. It's unbelievable how amazing the medical resources we have at our disposal are. Mm -hmm. Right. It's unbelievable. There should be everyone he, listening to this, anyone here, they should feel so over, like just unbelievably confident in their ability to help because they've got these resources. That but that, that's what they are. These are tools. Right. These are tools for us to use. These are the the wrenches for the tractor. These are the the you know, it's 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 amazing. And and I think that um the more you learn, right? The reason the reason why we say things like food education is the, the key to food freedom is, man, the more you know, the more you learn. Mm -hmm. You can do whatever diet you want. You can call it whatever you want. Every human's different. Every person's different. Mm -hmm. The foods you need, the experiences, the situations, the climate, everything. It's going to be different for every single person. Mm -hmm. right. And having the confidence to say, 
this is what's best for us in this moment for right now, right? Mm -hmm. Is uh, is a big deal. So yeah, I love that. I know we're short on time. As we wrap up here, why don't you guys leave us with a snapshot of your current life and food philosophy? So break down your farm and kind of talk us through how you view food today. So yeah, so as Tim said, uh, a couple years ago, we um, moved down to rural Tennessee and we have a 36 acre farm that we moved on to homestead really yeah. uh we're about half pasture half woods and we raise um burler chickens we um egg layers uh pigs cattle bees uh, cattle as far as beef cattle we don't have no cattle um Not bees yet. uh we have a large family uh, family garden just for us I think that's that's it. And we really follow. Uh, we we modeled after the Joel Salatin uh, Polyface uh, Farms. Yes, if anybody is familiar with that. If if you're not familiar, go read. You can farm. <laughs> look him up online. He's amazing, inspirational. Uh, so we are rotating our in the summertime. And so in the winter, we pull them off the pastures to give them a rest. But in the summertime, we are rotating our cattle daily on small. Um, paddocks um, mm-hmm. through our pastures. Um, our pigs, we move every two weeks through the edge of our woods. Uh, our chickens, we move, our meat chickens, we move daily in a well, in a chicken tractor mm-hmm. to a fresh piece of pasture. Um, our egg layers, we um, move there. They have a big um, coop and they can go wherever they want to, but we move their tractor around mm-hmm. um, every two to three days, just depending weather dependent. And then um, our bees are kind of uh, interesting. We we take most people aren't really familiar with with the approach we take. We use um, horizontal or lanes hives, and so usually when you see um, beehives, they, they're very tall. Have you seen that with like mm-hmm. you have the box and they kind of stack on top? So we have what's called horizontal hive. So where it's just like a, a picture like a big like treasure chest almost, and there are the frames that you put in there are about double the the width of or double the depth yep. Yep. of um, your traditional Langstroth frame. And it's a very natural beekeeping approach. And so we only cat, we only um, put wild swarms of bees. We don't buy bees to put mm-hmm. in our hives. We don't treat for any illnesses in our bees or any of our animal. I mean, naturally we, you know, if we need to treat for anything, but really we work on building robust immune systems and um, having strong genetics so that we don't have to treat. Um, And then we really, it's a very hands-off beekeeping approach. We add frames in the spring and then we harvest in the fall. Um, And we might not get quite as much honey as your traditional box approach, Um, but you get this super, super rich, complex dark honey that you know we don't feed any sugar water so there's no like sugar water being mixed into it it's just it's 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 great and so right now um as far as for the community we're only producing the eggs beef chicken and pork for the community the garden and the honey is just for ourselves right now and we're really at a point where you know because sam works this isn't our full-time gig uh sam works more than full time outside of the home, what fifty to sixty you know, it's fifty hour week hours job, a week take. outside the home, and so and farming is a lot, and mm-hmm. so we really were ramping up for our first year and a half, trying to figure out, okay, how can we do this in such a way where this can be our full time gig, mm. because we would love to have just a family integrated business business, right. you know, that you know I didn't we don't want Sam to be, you know, gone for, you know, the entire, as far as like the work week goes gone for, you know, their entirety of our kid's childhood. And then he gets to be home, you know, after they're out of the house. But <clears throat> I think it's hard for a generation of farmers like us who didn't, who are, who are first generation, who mm-hmm. didn't um, inherit land or who didn't get in on it, but really before 2007 mm-hmm. is really kind of the big kicker. 
because your mortgage on land, on you know your home and land, are it's just really hard to make enough on a farm in order to support yourself wholly on that, unless you have some sort of side hustle going on, whether you are monetizing online or you got some sort of other um, right. job, or you know you're really doing a lot of value added um, products. And so for us right now, we are just doing um, shares for our main. You know we're not. Uh, so we use a state a state processor. Um, state inspected in, local processor. Yeah, versus a USDA USDA um, processor. So we people, in a sense, are buying the animal for us from us, and then they are having it processed at right. the facility legally. Right. That is versus like, like you coming over to our house and I sell you a package of steak. Right. We don't do retail cuts, as it's called. We do, uh, you know, we do shares, so yeah. whole halves and quarters. Yep. And then the chickens, we do everything start to finish by ourselves, and so we are raising them, we are butchering them, we mm. are, you know, wrapping, wrapping, you know, gutting the whole thing ourselves. Um, and so, yeah, we're just really assess. You know, we have three little kids right now as well, and so just figuring out, okay, what do we want to maybe scale back and just do for our own family, and how much. Do we want it? Because we really get a lot of satisfaction out of providing that nourishing food for our community as well. And mm-hmm. so that's a big piece of it as well. So even though we don't make a ton on it, we provide it provides a lot of satisfaction that we can provide that for our local community. Uh, and, I, and as I said earlier, be, being in a rural area that doesn't necessarily value the type of farming that we're doing, we look really weird to our neighbors. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the people that like appreciate what we're doing, like they are super excited about it, but there's a lot of people that are, you know, kind of raising an eyebrow at, you know, yeah. you know, spray anything on your pastures, you know, that's not going to go so great for you, <laughs> Right. you know? So, right. um, it was that piece and what was. What was your other question? Well, that that tells me your food philosophy right there. You're prioritizing local, whole food. You're, yeah. You don't want to go to sprays or antibiotics or pharmaceuticals if you don't have to. And, um, yeah, I think you did a wonderful job. Yeah, there. and I would say that, yeah, my, really my base core philosophy with food is, you know, the way that God designed, you know, food to be grown, raised, and prepared like that's how we eat as our family and then we on, and then only supplement on top what has been so depleted in our soils and in our food that we can't necessarily get that anymore because i i have softened a bit on you know i kind of went from you know i started at the one extreme of you know taking a million supplements a day to taking nothing to recognizing that you know our soils don't look like um, they what they once did, and yeah. so there might be a little bit that we need to bat, add back into our diet that we can't necessarily get from the food. But as much as we can get, having that food first philosophy is yeah. kind of the core. So very a very simple food philosophy compared mm-hmm. to you know, some of those mm-hmm. you know highs and lows that we went through over the course simple. of our marriage. Yep. Yeah, yep. yeah. Sorry. No, no, you're I love fine. That. You're fine. Yeah, Sim- simple food. We want our food to taste good, be as healthy as we can with you know our. Uh, yeah, as healthy as we can, tastes good. And it is a big, it is, a, like we said earlier, though, it is a big part of our life in terms of time, right? Mm-hmm. And we are not experts. We are new, failing new, for it. <laughs> no, we're not experts. Oh, man. Okay? We have lot, we've learned a lot of things the hard way, which is a good way to learn things. Yeah. But, you know, and for the farm, one of the goals with the farm now is, because I do have a good job, and I don't, it'd be hard to quit a very good job to farm for, you know, almost nothing, right? So yeah. someday maybe, you know, my good job will allow us to retire earlier, and then we could farm full time. Blah, blah, blah. Right. But in the meantime, I would like the farm to be a closed loop, right? Yeah. Where the money I make on the farm, we make, sorry, on the farm pays for things for the farm. Like we're putting a lean to on the barn right now. Um, I've been buying some tractor attachments, like some bale spears and stuff. You know, I want the meat, I want the money from selling the beef to pay for the bale spear for the tractor so that it's not using my discretionary income. We're trying to like close that loop. So, on a very small scale, let's just say for someone that doesn't live on a 40 acre farm, they're like, well, I want to do bees. Okay, well, it costs money to start doing bees, but you could get a big hive of bees and you could sell half the honey the first year and half the honey the second year. And now your honey is paid for and you're supplying somebody else with honey and your your hive doesn't cost you anything because you paid for it, right? Mm-hmm. Like you could do that on a very small scale and close that loop, right? Like all the chickens we ate this year basically were free because of the chickens we sold, right? Yeah. And same thing, we haven't paid for pork other than the processing cost to the processor because we're selling other pork, right? So anybody yeah. could do that on any sort of scale. You don't have to do it with 40 acres. You could do it with a quarter acre, right? 
Um, you just got to figure out how to close that loop and make the stuff that you're raising for yourself paid for by selling something else. If mm -hmm. that makes sense. Just right. takes an investment and uh, time. That's really it does. Good. Yeah. 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 And I'll, I'll, I want to say one other thing too, because I, I misspoke earlier. When I ran my math on that, I said book 65 for meals um, because I, I did my math wrong on the number of servings. It's about $2 and 40 cents. Okay. Because mm -hmm. um, you're looking at about 400 meals a month. So I misspoke on that earlier. I don't want to mislead anybody, but either way, the point being we're eating our own healthy food for less than we can eat, you know, we can eat junk food for. So I just wanted to say that now. So somebody checks my math, they're going to be like, they're going to haunt you. No, 240 a serving is still so affordable, especially right. for the quality of food. So that's great. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, you can't, yeah, like, so you can't even go to McDonald's for that. No, so. you can't. What's the uh, name of your farm? Stone's Throw Family Farm. Stone's Throw Family Farm. Okay. We'll yeah. link that We're in the show in notes. Quebec, Tennessee. Looks like Quebec, but with a K and it's pronounced Quebec. Yeah. Oh, Quebec. They Tennessee. pronounce things very interestingly. They here. do. Like they'll say like, what do they call it? Um, a word that looks like it should be like La Follette or something. They'll be like La Follette. And I'm just like, uh -huh. yeah. And I was like, um, pretty you sure usually that's drop French. a syllable. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, it's funny. You mumble. Yep. We're, we're, we're getting there. We're, we're getting I, there. Didn't try to, I didn't practice my southern accent for this interview for everyone's sake, but I'm working on it, you know. Ooh, okay. I'm trying to sound like I'm from here, you know. Yeah. It's hilarious when he gets on work calls, you know, because he's he does sales out. in oh you know, he's very good at, you know, he he ended up in communications um in, in college in the end, and he's very good at modeling back. Mm. Or reflecting back to people. I wouldn't you know, say I'm that... very good. And I do do it though. The looks I give him while he's on the phone, it's she's like, "Who is it? Who are you?" You know. <laughs> I love that. That's so funny. That is so. Funny. Hey, what's uh, what's next for the farm? What? Oh man, what's what are you guys I excited about? A milk cow. Yeah, that's other than like adding mm -hmm. more to what we're currently doing. So like maybe more cows. We're still trying to dial in like the right number of some animals to manage the, yeah. the grass consumption with the hay that we need to produce all that right. Um, the next venture that wouldn't be just more of something that we're doing now would be, like Brett said, probably be a milk cow. But that you got to be really realistic about the time with that, right? Which because, is why we haven't done it yet. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, because mm -hmm. we still have three small children. And so, you know, that's... We're that's just starting to get to the point with our oldest that she is starting to be able to um, give back. Mm -hmm. And, you know, cause, you know, those young years, you are yeah. just pouring out, pouring out, pouring out. And, we're, you know, she's starting to be able to pour back into the family a little bit. And so be really helpful. Yeah. yeah. And it's really helpful having, you know, other families in our church that, you know, are, you know, 10 years ahead of us and that we can see it's like, okay, older kids are a game changer. <laughs> oh yeah. So, yeah. So that, yeah. As the kids get older, I think we would like to definitely add more, but mm -hmm. we gotta be realistic. So the milk yeah, cow would be the next right thing. Now. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see. It's cool. Yeah. So and excellence along. is often found in practice, right? You can get excellent at something by practicing it, but I feel like wisdom is found through experience mm. and y'all are wise. And so I, I, I thank you guys for coming on here today and would love to kind of give you guys the floor. There, There's going to be people listening to this that are in just a vast array of different stages of their real mm -hmm. food journey. And man, what are some of the things you would say to encourage or, or just, you know, give them some tips as mm -hmm. they're on that journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For definitely for the moms, like trust your intuition, you know, lean into that intuition. Cause, um, more there, there were so many times in my journey where I didn't have the data. I had the intuition and the data came later, Yes, but more times than not, you know, the intuition turned out correct. Um, and so that would be the first thing. And the second is, you know, even a small change is, in the in a positive direction is a, it w is will make a market difference in the end and is as and often will lead to more steps but don't focus necessarily on that end goal but just that next small step because mm -hmm. you know it yeah. it adds up which is no new advice i know mm -hmm. people have said that a hundred different ways you know over the generation mm -hmm. but right. you know, those are the two big things i'd say right yeah real food tastes better I promise you, you will feel better if you eat good. And um, like Brett said, you do not have to go cold turkey all the way to, you know, everything is healthy, but work your way up there little by little and it, it will pay dividends for sure. And I'll also say this too, you know, you won't do anything if you don't actually just do something. Like you you do mm -hmm. have to at some point start 
somewhere. Like mm-hmm. you got, you could talk about it forever, but you actually have to do something. So like pick something that's very tangible, that's a concrete step and then like do it right away because you'll never get somewhere if you don't actually just jump in. And, and if you wait until you're perfectly ready, like parenting, right? Or marriage. If you wait until all your ducks are in a row and you feel like you're fully researched and all of that, then you do something, you'll literally never do it. Mm-hmm. Like for us with farming, we, we bought animals and had them coming in the mail, like the chickens, right? Before we had a chicken coop built. That forced me to build a chicken coop, okay? So like there's steps that you can do to force yourself to do the thing that you want to do, but you got you to gotta, you gotta do it. And then it's okay mm-hmm. if you mess up along the way. You will mess up. Okay? Over and over again. Whether it's food mm-hmm. choices or trying to homestead or whatever, you're going to totally screw it up, and that's fine. Just at least you're doing something and you're working towards a goal. Right, and you can right? see that value in the what you've learned in the loss. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Mm. It's that's fine so to mess up on the way. And, and something that y'all talked about earlier, which is you just kind of were summarizing it again man, maybe it's just giving up that candy bar once a week or every day that you have it at lunchtime, or maybe it's that one dish that y'all love and you swap out one ingredient for something a little bit better. And yep. it's, uh, it's definitely doesn't have to be, you know, the cold plunge mm-hmm. of, you know, throwing everything out of the kitchen and under right. the sink and out of the, out, right. of, the, out of the bathrooms. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, or maybe it's just, you know, finding a place to buy some raw milk, start there, right? Yep. Maybe swap out your well, dairy first, right? Yeah. <laughs> One thing we would add, okay, so there are resources. You do not have to make this up from scratch, okay? Mm. If you go to uh, um, Eat Wild, all right? So concrete resources. Eat Wild is a like a Google Maps website mm-hmm. where there are pins that will show you farms like ours or veggie farms or whatever. Mm. And if you're like, okay, I would love to do this, but I have no idea where to buy raw milk. Go on Eat Wild, put in your zip code, and it will give you the names of those farms and then just, just call them. Be like, hey, we don't know anything about raw milk. Do you sell raw milk? Or we don't know anything about buying pigs. And if they're a decent farm, which they'll walk you right through the process of buying a pig, right? You, you don't have to make this all up and reinvent the wheel, okay? But yes. Eat Wild is a tremendous resource. There's a million different Facebook groups or whatever, but there's, there's a, a lot of stuff out right there over. where you can just get on with other people who are already doing it, and then you'll be, uh, you know, you'll be able to to figure this out without having to try to like make it all up, right? Mm-hmm. I love it, uh, Brett. Thank you guys. And Sam, thank you guys so much for jumping on with us today. And um, yeah, I'm sure we'll be talking to you guys soon. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Enjoy being here.